Hail, hail, and welcome. Welcome back to the uh, the first part of this podcast, the part that's been deleted that you haven't heard, if you're listening to it on iTunes, um, was it was just a rehearsal, right? <laughs> just us working out all, all the kinks. Harper had to get his story straight. That's what we should do every week, though. We should do that every week. We should just uh, do a quick rehearsal, get all the, all the stupid stuff out of the way, and then just get in and, and, and give people nothing but quality. But uh, I don't see that ever happen. So... <laughs> yeah, I know the words "homeboys" and "quality" going together in the same sentence definitely makes a man chuckle. Anyway, wait, there's, something, wait, there's something wrong here. What's wrong? How can I have me here? Oh, wait a minute. Say something. Hello. Well, that's uh, I had the headphones plugged into the iPad. Ah, oh, Jesus! Is that why you couldn't hear me? <laughs> and I just there a minute ago. I couldn't because I've got headphones on and it's. it's right. Sorry, carry on. Sorry. Anyway, anyway, so welcome, welcome back. <coughs> it's Tuesday, May the fourteenth. And we are back. The homeboys, the regular team are back, as usual. Of course, for anybody that's listening, we're just going to go through the same spiel again. We're joined by Jason Higgins. Hello. <laughs> we're joined by Paul Larkin. Good evening. And we're joined by uh, the, the famous Celtic centre half, uh, Celtic that I've never had, uh, David Harper. All right, man. And just before everything went tits up, um, we were talking, Harper was regaling us with tales of, uh, <clears throat> of, tales of woe and fairness. Uh, from playing at Celtic Park there on Sunday and uh, being a... Were, were you captain? No. Was there a captain? Uh, there was a captain each team. You had to... Um, <clears throat> once everybody had bought their positions and it was all set up, uh, there was an email sent to all the players and then there was a, a silent option to be the captain if you wanted to, to bid to be the captain. Oh, that's pretty cool. Just, right. just start. I mean, it's all for charity, so... I don't know how much the boy paid to be captain, but he, he, there was a captain his team, obviously, led the team out, led the huddle, all that kind of stuff. So. Right, so let me ask you, right, I, how does it work in terms of, like, you showing up with your gear? Did you have to go out and buy boots for this? I did, I. They're not going to supply boots, no? No, no, I had to go and buy boots, like. <laughs> that, does, does that seem a bit odd to you? No, I had to go and buy football boots. Yeah. I presume, I presume that the guys who run it just imagine that everybody who's we're going to play plays football. <laughs> <laughs> How wrong, wrong could they be? Um, um, so, I mean, in terms of like showing up at Celtic Park, how does it work? I mean, is it? Do you just show up and say, "Hello, my name is David Harper. I'm here to play." No, well, I, well, kind of. What, what happened was um, our game was shed, scheduled for a half past two kickoff. There was two games on the day, so there was a game started at something like ten o'clock. Um, I can't remember ten or eleven o'clock. Uh, so our game was scheduled for half past two, but we were to be there for one o'clock and a full hour and a half before it. So um, I just flew in the Sunday morning. Uh, I headed up to Celtic Park. I went, went, got, I went and got a breakfast, two rolls and sausage. Exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what Scott Brown has every uh, every day before a game. I, had two, I, I went to Witherspoon's where we were at Centre Station. I had two, two rolls of square sausages and a couple of cups of tea. I was so I was so <laughs> tempted. I was so tempted to have a pint. Like, I, I, I never. I, was like, I, I just stuck to tea. So anyway, I was just killing time because of the couple of hours. Like, do you know what I mean? So we're in there. Uh, Vicky, my wife, was with us. So she headed over to uh, Queen Street to collect my daughter. Um, so I headed up to Celtic Park. I went in the. I don't know. Look about the superstore and that. But ten to one, and I met KK and his lovely wife Ashley. So then we headed in, and uh, you just head in the front doors of Celtic Park. Just up you go, walk in, there was a representative of football aid there, obviously, because they know people are coming. Just give your name. He's there, right? Yeah, all right. Oh, all right, yeah. right. So, uh, so uh, you just give your name. The, the, the team sheet there, you just gave your name, and then you headed up to the, the, the suite upstairs. I think it's the Jockstein suite, is it? Um, two, two flights up. Uh, I think it's the Jockstein. It's the top suite, anyway. So we, we went up there. Uh, we just sat at the side because the, the, the team one, the game one guys were up there having their, their man of the match presentations and stuff like that, moment of the match, and just saying a thank you to the players and the, the fans that come and support them. So, so that was quite good. We were sitting about because I, I presumed that the people coming to to watch the game, like guests, would just go in like they'd have a turnstile on them because you could pay a fiver to get in. And I just presumed they would go in that way and go and sit in the, in the main stand, like, do you know what I mean? Mm. But it wasn't every, everybody who was going came in the front doors, uh, headed up the suite, had full access to the suite the whole time. You could get a few drinks, something to eat. Probably the game was going on in that as well. Like the, the place was fully opened. 
for the people watching that, which was pretty good. Like they sat in the director's box. Do you know what I mean? That's great. Uh, so they had full access to all that. Uh, so then, so we, so we about maybe <clears throat> just after one o'clock, we were the, the other the game one had finished. They'd all left. We were called in, uh, given our sort of instructions, kind of meet and greet with everybody for the football aid and the players that were there and that. And of course, I met Big Craig, who won the competition. Who giant Jason? You met Craig. Yeah. Smashing, smashing big fella. Uh, really, really, uh, a real diamond guy. So I'm really, I'm really. I am really glad he he won the prize, like because he he really he really deserved it actually, because he appreciated it so much. Anyway, so we we done all that meet and greeting, and they said uh, there would be a, a special surprise guest waiting for us uh, when we made our way downstairs at the dressing rooms. So uh, we headed great, down. Great quiet. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we headed down, and I kind of I kind of half guessed what it would be, but we headed down and, and into the boardroom. And uh, the SPL trophy was there for us, so oh. uh, we, so we could all get our pictures with the trophy, and it was full hands on. You could pick it up and whatever, like that. I mean, so you all got pictures with the trophy. Then you just just headed in to, to get dressed like you were a football player. It was just completely and utterly surreal. Walks into the home dress room, and it's just all there. Your, your jersey's hanging up on your peg. Harper number five. The shorts and socks are all folded up. The lot. A bottle of water, a bottle of orange juice, team sheet, just that's it, just to get changed and go out and have your warm up. Eh? So, um, everybody just in more chatting with each other and that, and get to know a few guys. And it was actually good because KK and Craig were both in the home team, so it was a wee bit, it settled the nerves a wee bit, and there was people there that you knew. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, Paul Byrne, who has <laughs> been famous, who's been photobombing Danny McGrain, I have to say. <laughs> Paul, Paul, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, Paul Byrne, he, he played in the first, he was actually on the same flight as me coming over, but I've never seen him. He played in the first game as well, the second half, and unfortunately he'd done his calf in it. But uh, he liked to, to, to struggle on in our game as well and play for the home team. Uh, George McCluskey was playing for the away team. So anyway, we, we got dressed, and I have to say that the initial going out for the warm up was just to just walk around and go down the tunnel. I was. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not pretending I was 16 year old again. Yeah. So I mean, I just ran, ran down the tunnel, and jumped on, and done a few. They you know jumps in that, and stand jumps <laughs> to the side, like I was a real football player, looking up, thinking, oh, like my wife and my daughter, and that would already be in the main stand, turned around, like and it was named to there. <laughs> they, they were all bus- too busy and drinking. So anyway, the warm up went on for about 20 minutes or so, right, and I was gobbed. I mean, <laughs> gobbed. And I'm thinking to myself, how am I ever going to play a game? I'm blowing my ass here. Try to, try to do stretches that I need to stretch and anything. Because I, I can't even remember what to stretch or how to stretch. And I was just doing things that I thought I'd seen people do on television. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, maybe you know that when you lift your leg up and then move it to the right. Aye, aye, aye. Like, oh, that, oh, that part. I wasn't even doing anything apart from hurting me. <laughs> 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 so, so then, listen, then the day we got a football and we just went into wee triangles and did all the wee one touch pass and that which was grand but then I twisted my left ankle before the warm up was even done I couldn't have believed it like, but I've always had a weak left ankle but there you go so anyway we went back into the dressing room uh, Danny McGrain was there because he was the home team manager John Kennedy had, he'd been sent to Celtic to scout the island so, so he wasn't there unfortunately so we went back in everybody got the final, final ready, and then we had a wee, a wee chat. Uh, we were actually a man done because the the captain had bought two forty five minute positions, so he had two jerseys. Because we're like, there's a jersey here for when a man shot for a second half sub, but he'd actually bought two forty five minutes because that's all that was left. But it's actually turned out. I know that sounds like he'd only been replacing himself anyway, but it actually turned out with injuries in the second half, we could have been. We actually had to get one of the away team subs to come back on to play for our team to make up the numbers, so we were kind of shot. So, anyway, um, to cut a long story short, then, just we headed back out and to the tunnel, and my team, and now this is going to explain the 13 2 scoreline, right? Ah. My team was like all built like me. 
which doesn't say a lot for the rest of the players. And they were all a wee bit my age group, older, solid. some younger. They were solid, you mean? Solid. Ah, yeah, yeah, that, that's one way of putting it. If you ran into me, you'd know you'd run into me anyway. <laughs> so, that's what solid means. So we're lined up, you know how you see it in the television, the Champions League, the two teams lined up before they go down the tunnel. Yeah. And I'm looking, and the boys were all in their 20s. That entire team, the 20 year olds, and they had one senior citizen in the team who was in his 50s. And it was all, and I just thought, oh my God, we're going to get ran about ragged here, like, which pretty much is how the game went. But we saw, we come down the tunnel and they had the, the I think it was the champ, I can't remember if it was the Celtic song there, or the Champions League music that was playing, I can't remember, they had something playing anyway. And then we came down and we done the lineups like you see from the Champions League, the two teams with the referees in the middle with their wee mascot each and all that. And they read all the players' names out and everything and it was, it was it was pretty mad, I have to be honest, like, standing there, it was, it was, it was a dream come true, it's the sort of thing you dream about when you were a wee boy, like. yeah. and then we got the, the team photos then, we lined up for the team photos, and just got on with the game, but I, I think probably the highlight for me was when we went into the huddle, like, honestly man, I was shaking in the huddle, and I know it's just guys I've never really met before, and there's nobody there apart from maybe about 100 people in the director's box, but. I was shaking, but in that huddle, it just felt this is this is what they do. Like, you know, this is this is playing for Celtic. It's just one of those it's, things. You as know, close as you're going to get for somebody like me, this is playing for Celtic. Because I think this is the experience. When you see the huddle on TV, you always think, "What's going on in there?" Uh, you know what I mean? So say when you're in there, you're going, "This is bizarre." Uh, I can't even remember what the boy was saying, but he was uh, he was taking it serious anyway. So the game started and we, we found it pretty quickly that it was going to be one way. Although I think we played the better football <laughs> when we got the ball. We were trying to play a bit passing game in that because we knew we never had the legs. But the other team quickly sussed it. All they had to do was knock it out of the top of our, our back three because we never had a left back for a start. Because Paul Byrne, you know, we had to buy our positions. Yeah. And somebody bought the right back, I'd got centre half, another guy got centre half. <clears throat> Paul Byrne was penciled in as the number three. And he, he obviously wasn't going to play left back, but everybody else had bought centre forward to left back. So nobody would go in the left back. So we basically had three men at the back all the time. And they, they, they just kept knocking the ball over the top, running on, scoring goals. But the, 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 the game isn't important. But I have to say, right, do you know how the marathon runners say they, they hit a wall, right? <laughs> and if you get through it, then you'll be all right. I can remember at one point in the game, and I'm, and I'm thinking it must be nearly half time. Because I'm going to collapse here. Like, at least I just want to go off. And I says to the referee, I says, Ref, how long left? He goes, oh, you've got another 26. Oh, we've got one. We'd only played for 19 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, but I managed to, I had to say, I managed to get through it. I didn't have a bad moment in the first half. I went down, I'd done my shoulder, and it's still, it's an absolute agony still. I don't know what I've done it, but it's, it's agony. It's got to half time, and they were absolutely rolling to each other in the dressing room. I mean, go mad because we're behind defenders need to defend and all that. And then I just lost the hate the attackers for shouting at the defence because I was the defence. Let's <laughs> just let's just say the words exchanged and I wasn't having it. This sounds like an episode of Jossie's Giants or something. <laughs> uh, that's kind of what it was like. Uh, Jossie's Giants in the hoops. Uh, well, it was a shame for one guy. Actually, my centre half partner he went off injured, done his hamstring after about ten minutes, which is a shame because like the guys paid all that money. And ten minutes into the game, he was off. The big Craig, so big Craig was on. Big Craig got more more of the game than he thought he would get as well. Like, so it was that was great. Like, you know what I mean? But now, nah, so I went back out the second half, and I sat in the dugout because um, I didn't think I would have to go back on. But 10, 15 minutes of the second half, another boy came off injured. So, and Paul Byrne had went off injured with his calf as well early in the second half. So, this is crazy. I couldn't, have, I couldn't have believe I had to go back on. To be honest, with you. Like, it sounds like the start. Then, it sounds like the start of saving Private Ryan. Just lads people going people were just going to be left, right, and centre because they probably done the same as me. I had knew about this six months and started going out for walks and jogs about six weeks ago. Oh, I mean, just thought ah, I'd be all right. I used to play football when I was at school. <laughs> <laughs> be all right. Here, just a quick question: Did you mention that Danny Danny McGrain, how he, uh, he he blanked you and drawed at that time for a photograph? I didn't you know. I never got the chance because uh, this was one of the things that. I, I know Danny McGrain was supposed to be the manager, and I, we were expecting him to be in the dugout, but he just came in and see everybody, and then, and then he was gone. Like. Um, I, don't, I think he was there for the whole first game. He probably you know, walked in and seen you and went, listen, there's nothing I can do here. Somebody, somebody <laughs> said he was a bit hungover, so I think Danny decided just to do one. 
Uh, and John, as I said, John Kennedy, he'd been sent to Ireland on some scouting in Ireland, so who he was away watching, I don't know. But so we were left to Paul Burn and George McCluskey, as I have to say. But uh, really, I want to talk about um, George. George and Paul were, were absolutely fantastic. George played the full game, and he can, let, me, let me tell you, I don't know how old he is exactly, but he's still got the moves. Like I suppose you never lose it. And, and Paul Byrne for carrying injury, I mean, the, you can see these guys have still got the, the first, they get the ball and the heads up right away and there's a pass to release straight away. They've still got all that, like, you know what yeah. I mean? They never lose that, like, it's amazing to watch, like. Ah, you see the, you see the difference as well. I played five sides with a few folk that were played pro and stuff like that, and it's just, it's like Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> and, and, and especially, like, when they're running about, when guys like me, you know what I mean? But listen, honestly, I can't even say how much, just... It was at the end of the game, there was a point when I just went over myself and stood in the centre circle. It just, just looked a bit, man. The place is, we're standing in that centre circle, the place is vast. It is a coliseum, man. And when you stand in there and you start to think about the noise that's created on a Champions League night or something like that, and it must, it, it must, to me, talk about a, a support being a 12th man, it must be, man. The noise that it creates when you're actually on that pitch, I think you get a more sense of what it must be like. If, even though you're not hearing any noise there, I think you get a sense of what it would be like when you're playing. Because even when we were playing, you could hear the wee shouts for the for the stand when anybody was going through, clear through and goal when there was only 100 people. So the buzz players must pick up for the crowd. It must, it must be incredible. It must be absolutely electric. And I'm telling you now, I'm telling you right now, Anybody who can should get involved in this next year. Get involved in this because it will live up to your every expectation. It is living the dream. That's the catchphrase they say a hundred times at the end of the day, football league guys. This is you guys living the dream. Get the full experience. And it is the full Celtic experience. That is living the dream. Like. Was there any was there any talk of like the football league and all? I mean, was there anything they're representing where, where the money went to? Was there any info or was there any, anybody be do, doing a talk or something about you know well, f- f- football aid side of things? Well, if you remember Chris who came on the show, yes, uh, a couple of months back, he he, he was sort of the lead guy there. They had, they had a staff of about five or six football aid representatives who were there for your every need. By the way, anything you wanted, they would go and sort it get it. Even to the point where you walked to a door, they would hold the door open for you. Do you know what I mean? It was that kind of experience. They wanted you to feel like a football player. Yeah. It was septic. It was full. I mean, nothing spared. And it was it was quite good at the end after the, we'd, we'd come in. We'd had a show on that and you went back up to the suite. And then they had a, a presentation for man in the match and moment in the Man of each team. So the man of the match for each team. And then it was a moment in the match. So a great save, a great shot. So like, but then they went through like, a lot of the sponsors. And some of the good sponsors, like the, the people who provided the kits, they, they were all provided free. And the people who done the numbers, the same people who do the numbering and the names and Celtics jerseys, they all provide that for free. And of course, you get to keep the kit. Do you know what I mean? And I'm glad I wasn't in the waiting because for some reason they, they were landed with the wasp. I've seen that there. And like, what? I thought that was a bit strange. I, I'm telling you right now, is what it was, and I, when I said there was two things that I thought were a wee bit disappointing. The one was Danny McGrain and John Kennedy you know, being there as kind of advertised. Uh, but it didn't really bother me, but some younger guys there, maybe that would have meant more to them than likes of me, if you know what I mean. And you've paid a lot of money. And at the same time, I know John Kennedy's away doing a club thing, which is fair enough. Like, I mean, I don't think anybody was overly bothered about it, but I'm just, I'm nitpicking here, but I'm saying this, this, is that, this isn't someone else say, oh, this was a bad thing. I mean, it's only two things I could, I could find to nitpick about was that and the fact that they were given the, the, that yellow and black monstrosity a strip. I just didn't understand that. I thought it would have been the black strip. But as I say, it's a small crime. I suppose the main oh. thing is playing in the park, which. Ah, but seriously, you should have got, you should have got the centenary strip or the black strip. I have, you know? I have, well, that's what I'm saying. I think, I, I think so as well. Like. No centenary, but, but said, the 125th year one, eh? As I said, it's not Celtic that supply the strips. Oh, Celtic's, right, okay. Celtic's nothing to do with it. It's a right. other sports company provide the kits for all the, ga- for all the games for free. Oh, see. Right. So, so you're basically talking about, I think there was 15 in each team, uh, two games, so that was 60. 60 kits they provided for for the Celtic games alone. Like. I take it you didn't get the player issue jersey, no? 
No, no, it's the same. It's the same strip that you would go and buy at the Celtic shop. I don't know about the shops. And the socks were like proper, like I suppose professional socks. You even told you what was the left foot, what was the right foot. Right. <laughs> I've, never seen, I've never seen that before in football socks. Like, <laughs> and they were the proper like. They, they actually, it was hard to get the socks on them at that time, had all that padding around the feet and all that sort of stuff, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think I think that was the right thing, there was the black socks as well to go with the hoops, which I thought was quite, I actually thought was quite good. Because uh, it kind of makes it sort of unique for that year. Well that was a great story Harper, thanks a lot, because you've given me time to eat my dinner. <laughs> That's <what I> <laughs> That's my dinner, Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why you were being so quiet. See, see, to be honest, I don't want to go too much into the, the fundraising side of the stuff, but, which has been absolutely fantastic. I think they were talking about the record year, the football league, because this was all over the UK. It's teams in the, the every team in the English Premiership, half a dozen teams in Scotland, um, international teams in Scotland England. And something I didn't know, which I probably had heard, but I just forgot, Celtic were actually the founding, they were the joint founders of this charity. They were the first club to put this on 13 years ago, and they've had it every year since. So it was Celtic that actually started this. They were the first team in the UK. They started up with the guys in the football aid. So uh, they, they spoke about that when we, when we were in the, in the Jock Steen suite. So no, as I say, I didn't want to go into that too much because Chris, who was on with us a couple of months ago, he's going to come on with us uh, maybe the start, the start of the next season or sometime during the summer if we do a, like a show during the summer because they've still got a few games to go. And actually, listen, if there's anybody listening to this and you, you, maybe, you maybe support an English team, your second team, an English team of that, or you just maybe fancy getting kicked out and go and play in a, a Premiership stadium, there are still games to go before the end of the season. There's still places left in clubs and you could probably pick up a position there, I'd say, for two or three hundred quid. With some of the guys were getting the ones that sell the game last minute for 250 quid. So if you go to the Football Aid website, it's just footballaid.com, and there's still places left in, in, in Premier League games and I think maybe a couple of games up in Scotland. So if you fancy getting yourself kitted out and go and play in a big stadium, for getting the full experience, by all means, I would say go on that website and have a look. Sounds Good brilliant. Stuff. Sounds brilliant. I'd say like when you're walking out, walking out, out the tunnel, you're just imagining the place being full, were you? <laughs> Do you know what, man? I had, my biggest fear on the day was dying on the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, being, I'm, being, I'm being completely serious. I no, what Renick said to me, Joe. Wow. Renick said to me, but at least if you die, they'll probably put a statue up or something. Or kick some sort of <laughs> and that's a lot good to me. Like, you know what I, mean? <laughs> I, I was very conscious of how unhealthy and unfit I felt. But I'll tell you, to come through how much I did, I actually, I, I'm more about now thinking I'm, I'm a football player. Like. <laughs> because you, I did die. You can be up a draw to up a draw to park now. You know the park where you're where you're uh, hunky dory's park where your boots will you? What are you gonna uh, do? With, what are you gonna do with those boots now? Yeah, keep them for next year. You, you, your, your your comeback is it? I I I'm telling you, I enjoyed it so much. The experience was so good. Um, I think I will play again next year because I felt that I didn't do myself justice football wise. I had a few nice wee touches, I'll say, but I think if I was fitter, I could have enjoyed it even more, if you know what I mean. Aye, but you hadn't kicked a football in 12 years. What if you hadn't done yourself just as football ways? I mean, no, I just what would your last I would, game? I, would, I, would, I just felt I would have enjoyed it more if I had took part in the game more, if you know what I mean. Oh, okay. Makes but uh, I've got the DVD coming, Joe, so no doubt uh, you, we'll, we'll, we'll have one night watching it on your big projector screen. Absolutely, I just got a fix there recently. Uh, is, uh, there you go. I can't, I can't wait to see you huffing and puffing around the pitch. And there's one other thing I was going to say. Paul Bunn, who, who, he, was, he was 10 out of 10, as I say, he's in Dublin. He still plays in Dublin over 35s league. Yeah. So, uh, as I say, he, he, he still had all the touches and the moves in that league. Uh, there's actually a Celtic Legends game going to be in Dundalk uh, sometime next month, Joe. Yeah. Uh, uh, I said uh, I'd give you a shout and with Paul Burns I'll give him a phone and we'll head up with Paul to the Celtic Legends game That'd and then Doc I think it's the 15th or the, it was either 15th or the 22nd of the next month I can't remember but I'll find out but if anybody in this area Louth, Dublin keep an eye out for that there's a, there's a Celtic Legends game and, and then Doc I think it's just to raise, raise uh, funds for the club well, yeah. That sounds very good 
And as I say, uh, Paul Bunn, he's been uh, all over Twitter recently, that's all I'll say. <laughs> Aye, I seen it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny. Oh, funny man, so it was. What's he what's he doing on Twitter? I, I missed that then, though. I'll send you. <laughs> send me it. All right, no problem. Go ahead, I shall, yes, sorry. I shall, I shall send you now on the on the phone boys Facebook group. Right? Go for it. <laughs> right, any anyway, suggestion? What you gonna say there? No, I'm just gonna talk about the game and stuff. I was um, go ahead, far away. It did, it did get presented in the league. Oh, wait, 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 just one other thing, sorry, can I say, I really want to thank, obviously, Vicky and my daughter for coming to the game, and uh, Chick, Chick, uh, Charlie, Chick1967, and Jim Haddo, GH, uh, JMH1972, Jim and, Jim and Chick came to the game and they had a few drinks and that, and a few drinks after and that, and that was great, so, uh, and they, they obviously had money went to football and that as well, so, no, just thanks to, to Chick and Jim and, and my daughter and Vicky for, for coming along and support me and everybody else who, Came and supported everybody else. I've seen Sorry. Everybody else at the night at a tenner for the raffle. Oh, of course, aye, aye. And as I said, um, I think this is something that homeboys will definitely be involved in next year. Uh, yes. And we'll definitely do the same again. We'll try to we'll raise the money. We'll maybe even go up to three places next year. Um, and I'm sure one of you boys probably want to, maybe two years or three years, or everybody may want to get involved next year. Because I'm telling you, uh, someone just to, just to go just go and do it. Yeah, I'm just looking at your team photograph here, right? N- not that old. You look like one of the oldest there. That's right. I'm wait a minute. I'm one of the oldest there. Hold on a second. See, there's a, is that a girl in gold? <laughs> <laughs> that was another girl you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. She's I'm too young. She's 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 Eight, nine. There's about nine over over thirties there. Aye. And the rest of them, well, the other two, <laughs> I suppose, are young. Aye. So. Um, and oh, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't think of everything. Talk about KK's moment. We well, had a moment. We well, had a moment. A shot. His chance to bust the net, Celtic Park. No. Flying over the bar. Oh. Open no. goal, six yard. No. What? What was your man? What was the famous guy, Van Vossen? Was that Van, Van Vossen? Vossen aye. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was a damn boss and believe me that bit of the DVD will be getting uh, extracted <laughs> and going back to what I like I can promise you we'll be seeing that oh, I'd say, but I'd say this is one of those moments where the ball drops for you and you're, you're, you're just thinking about Hollywood you're going watch me some people are going to watch me forever this is great and you just balls it up do you know what it's my one regret actually the whole thing I never once just went and put the ball in the net even before the game or after the game or half time or anything I didn't just go put one in the net just to say I'd done it. Oh, for the warming up, I did. That's right, that's true. In the box. <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't allowed to warm up in the box. That was the ground staff. They had the goals set up to the side for the for the warm-up. You know, they have the goals that carry away. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the, the groundsmen, because obviously it's the end of the year and there was a game on before us and they just try to keep the boxes obviously got a lot of action happen. So we weren't allowed to warm up in the box. So there you go. I was, or I would have, I would say. Well, in fairness, it sounds like your box had plenty of action. You should have went the other one. Wasn't much going on down there. See, I actually thought, I, was, I kept asking the referee, tell me when there's five minutes to go, because I, I did say to myself, if there's one comes into the box here, I'm just going to batter it in for an OG. <laughs> I didn't even get the chance to do that. <laughs> just to say you'd scored a goal at Sally Clark. Right. <laughs> <laughs> sounds brilliant, mate. It does, brilliant. it sounds fantastic. I said, I'm, listen, I'm probably not doing it any kind of justice at all I'm just telling you it's something that I, I don't think you can it, it's your own personal sort of I think it's a, such a personal experience to your feelings that it's hard for me to put in the words what it meant to, to, to walk down that tunnel running that pit, like just warming up and have the music playing at the time or like they would have music playing on a match stage you know what I mean just start warming up and you're looking about and you're going I'm really doing this thing and I started thinking, honestly, I started thinking about when I was 14 year old standing in the jungle, never thinking that for a minute, one day I would play football on that pitch, on that mm-hmm. path, run down that tunnel in the hoops. It is, it is that sort of experience that it's, indescri- it's hard to put it words. It takes much something more uh, audible than me Hell- to. Aye, you, aye, somebody, somebody with equilibrium, Jason. 
Oh, you still, you, you still that's a mess, boys. Joking. Uh, you still got Paul to tell your story for you there. Uh, as soon as I said, I'm not saying. No, so I just, we'll get off me, but I have to say, it was a wonderful experience. I can't thank the guys for football either off. And it, it really was everything. Was that one last the facilities, the facilities were amazing. The, the, the people in the park, the phones, the taxi after the game in the front door, just. Everything you were treated like a king from the minute you were there to the, to the minute you left. And as I say, all the guests were treated well. You, as you came along, you had full access to, to get the pints and that, which, which I found out straight after the game because my wife was pushed. <laughs> <laughs> she, was she not screaming your name from the start, no? And then, of course, everybody then, the kids all got to come on and get their pictures in the dugouts and you know, on the side of the park and all that. And that. So it was... It, at the end of the day, it turned into a real sort of family thing. It was, it was brilliant, honestly. Was there was any? Really good. Was there any debris in the changing rooms left over from the day before? No, there was no few bottles of champagne knocking around or few cans. Uh, no, there wasn't. But uh, the boys, Chris, one of the organisers, was telling me that they had to when they arrived, all the ticker tape was still over the pitch that morning, so all the football aid guys had to go out and clear the, the pitch or the or the debris from the day before me. Jesus. Well, anyway. Let's move on. That sounds, that sounds, that sounds absolutely brilliant, I have to say. It's right, definitely, move on. I'm just trying to think about the picture to send you, I'm, 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 I'm seriously jealous. I'm dying to do it now. So I, I feel like you should just go out and start training now for next year because I'm dying to do it. You should. Anyway, let's move on to the, to the game on Saturday. Uh, 4-0 against St. Johnson. Nice way to uh, pick up the trophy with a good win. Uh, take it. Jason, you were there? Aye. You were there with Aye. the, the Waynes? No, they, there was uh, the... Linda's granny's 90th birthday, so it was their great granny's birthday party, so they had to go to a party for her. 90? And then Jesus. She's 99, and uh, so I got, because it was my mate's, uh, me boy's first communion as well, so I'd have probably been at that, so I got to go to the game. And uh, I know it was happy days, enjoyed it, and uh, did really well. Scott Brown, brilliant. It was, uh, I, it was, it was a, a nice change, I think, for recent weeks, where we've Maybe saying no being at our best has been an understatement of the century. But uh, I thought they played really well. I thought Ledley's goal was an absolute cracker. That was. Uh, aye. Uh, we James Forrest and Scott Brown uh, added a great dimension to the team. And uh, I just thought they played absolutely excellent. And I thought that scumbag that tried to take Lustig's head off with the elbow with his two-match ban. Terrible. Hmm. But uh, what are you doing? It seemingly there was three of them didn't they clap Celtic on the park, but uh, mm-hmm. that says says more about them than it does about us. But no, I really enjoyed it. And uh, towards the end of the game, at half time, I met Jimmy, <laughs> one of the guys I met her in uh, Lisbon. Jimmy he lives down in Lancaster. So me and Liam, uh, Brummy boy, met him at half time, and Liam and his two nephews uh, up for Birmingham Aston Villa supporters. He'd them at the game. And then about 10 minutes to go with the game, Mrs. Right, one will make her way around to the Rangers end and watch the celebrations for in there so that we can get a sort of quick, sharpish getaway. We walk around, where did I find the parrot's perch? <coughs> Just get round there and the parrot, met the parrot. So we watch the celebrations with Mr. Monaghan at the end. And no, I thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, great to see the boys lift the league again. Doesn't matter what age you get, but it always gets you see when the the old championship trophy is up there. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant. Can not beat it? So, no, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And then after the game, we're along at the Supporters Association, met some guys for the Kano, Kano Foundation, and uh, there'll be meeting with them. But I'm going to try to help them do some fundraising and stuff like that uh, going forward. So, no, lovely, lovely squad of guys and girls. And, uh, no, it was great to meet them and find out what their aspirations are for the future. So I'm going to try and do a bit for that. Can I ask you? You mentioned Scott Brown there. Do you think the the, the lackluster performances recently have been have been part of Scott Brown being missing? Because I mean, he came back there on Saturday and he was he was a powerhouse, like. Eh, uh, quite possibly. Maybe a few different reasons as well. Uh, Neil Lennon gave people holidays and that during the season, quite unprecedented. But uh, I could have been a contributing factor because he was different class. You know, he was the best player in the park by a country mile. Yeah. And uh, I think missing me, James Forrest, as well. When he plays, uh, when we've got the guys attacking in the wings, uh, it adds a different dimension to our game. And something that Celtic need, and throughout all the years with Celtic, attacking wing backs, attacking wingers, uh, when we go at teams like that, especially at home, there is usually no stopping us. And uh, it was a very comfortable victory. We're delighted. I was delighted to see Fraser Red score an OG at the end as well. Aye. Mm. 
Because, you know, he's obviously a prick. Aye, uh, I think I can have a few expletives. Aye, uh, definitely. But, uh, aye, two match ban as well. Lenny gets three matches for calling somebody a fanny. He nearly takes somebody's neck off and uh, he gets a two match ban. And you see, you see, you you've seen the replay, like, I mean, it was intentional, like. Oh, I totally. Completely intentionally, but then there the elbow, like, I, I'm going to take this guy. Wasn't it just, uh, it wasn't just about the elbow, he, he had a look first. Yeah. Make yep. sure you can see where his target was and then went in, so, aye. Aye, tried to take the heat off him. I don't blame Lustig for, for making a big issue, like, because, like, kind of, at first I was like, listen, just let it go, and then I seen the replay, and I was like, Jesus Christ. Aye, aye, he could have broke his jaw, he could then could have harmed. I, I'll be honest with you, watching the, the end of the game, I was wishing there was more time left in the game. So somebody would get the chance like, to do it. I got too. back. Ah, because that's that, that's the way it works. You just you know the way it works in baseball. You do something to somebody, you get it back, and that's just the way it works. And if ever time I played football, as me, I was um, I'm a football player. I know these things, right? <laughs> <laughs> somebody gets you. Somebody gets you. One of your teammates gets gets them back for you if they can. And I was watching the game, and I thought I was saying, who actually on that park would go and do that? But it would be near him. And I thought maybe Stokes could be the boy, just the just the boy for the job. But uh, we kind of ran out of time. But I was, yeah. I was actually praying for somebody to do him the rest of the game. Aye. So no, I, I was delighted. So a great day. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I was a great game to watch. I mean, like you say, Ledley's goal was a cracker. Now, I'm going to talk about Ledley. If I have my way, right? Now, I know Sammy got player of the year, right? Which I, which I, I find a bit bizarre. Does anybody else find that a bit, bit strange? Yes. I do as well. Okay, well, yeah. let, let's go to the table here, right? Who would you have given it to? Jason, Chris who, Commons. You were Chris Commons? I, I would agree with Paul. Chris Commons. But you, yeah. Harper? Uh, Chris Commons and a close second, uh, for, uh, Foster. See, I, I was thinking of Joe Ledley. Mm. Ah, he's, he's done well, but nah, Chris Commons. I suppose, like, I mean, if, he's if, made the difference. If, you, if you're thinking about impact players and guys that make a big difference on the pitch in terms of like standing out, yeah, Chris Commons. But I mean, I, the reason I say Joe Ledley is because he's, he's just he's a steady player, and when he when he when he's Put out of the team for like a poor performance, he takes his medicine and he comes back twice as strong. I mean, and that's I suppose like maybe it's my personal preference, the kind of football players that I like. But he's it's the kind of player that I like, you know. He's just he's, he's tough. He, he doesn't make a big fuss. I mean, but, but when he when he puts his, his work in and puts a shift in, he's dynamite. No, I think, I think Sammy Sammy basically made the club more money than anybody else with his goals in the Champions League. So he's major contributing factor to that. Probably that was the reason he got it. I don't know, but. There's no way in the world he was the best player on our team this year. But who, who, who was it that picked us? Was this, this was the other players, was it? Fans. Fans. Was it the fans? Oh, there you go. It's very strange because, as, as we all said, Chris Commons, the majority of people I've spoken to said Chris Commons as well. So, you so how, did you, how, how did you get a vote for this, Paul? Just on the website. All oh, right. With the website, you know. But no, I mean, no. you'd never... I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I think you would you could make a strong case for other players being as good as Sam Rass in the Champions League. Yeah. You know, Lexi like Hooper and Commons and Foster were all absolutely immense as well as was Victor Wanyama. Aye. Uh, uh, definitely Foster, anyway. I mean, definitely Foster. I was actually just watching a compilation there of a couple of his saves because he got save of the season today, didn't he? With, uh, did he? he did. He got save of the season. And I was watching a few of his saves there from this season and he's just... I mean, what we say... I'd say he eclipses Arthur Barts, does he? In terms of like goalkeeping ability, um, or am I or am I stretching it too far? No, no, I, I, I would take him before Boric. But uh, I think Boric, when he first came, was brilliant. He was different class, but sort of soured with uh, his performances at the end. They'd go overweight, and he wasn't pulling his way. Well, that's the thing. And, Towards uh, the end, he became more of a character than a player. You know what I mean? Oh, he, it was and the, the idolisation the fans had for him in that whether it was just a wind up because of that daft song but uh, mm. nah I was hacked off him at the end I was I mean the amount of goals he cost us you know in his last season or two it was nah it was terrible but no at the start it was really good uh, when, when we had Boris at the start he, he was a he was a he was a top class keeper he was yeah. and he was he was I mean he was a top goalkeeper in Poland he was a Polish number one and that guy I mean Joe you know the guys, uh, Magic and Arik and that, and yeah. Thomas uh, and Work. He's a god and, uh, there. Two, two of the guys came over with me to see Celtic play Motherwell. Mm. And they only came over to see Arthur Boric play. You know what I mean? He's and a, at, at that time, they, did, they said to me, he could, run for, he could run for president in Poland and they'd get it. <laughs> that's, that's how sort of high regard he was held over there. And a lot of this today was sort of the, the, the party boy lifestyle they had as well. And, but I think also, he never ever lost his... Uh, 
touch with the fans. I know you remember he used to always walk off the pitch and he'd go do the L sign to, to the camera. Right. That was for uh, that was for the uh, Leeds Warsaw Warsaw fans, yeah. like, uh, who, who he still goes and mingles with at games and gets them probably more bothered than he should to be honest for a professional football player. But I think that's all what sort of added to the Boric's mystique for Celtic fans as well because uh, all the stuff he done at Ibrox to wind them up with a bless himself. Probably that guy that should like wind them up, you know. but you know what I mean. He, he used to emphasise things: the Pope T-shirt, yeah. God bless the Pope T-shirt, the grabbing the. The flag and running across the park at Ibrox right. Stand. Let's, let's, let's look at them. We all love that. Yeah. Oh, right. But I mean, the, the thing that I'm saying about Virginia having Forster is we've watched Forster gone from being kind of like a, a no mark, sort of half decent goalkeeper to being like one of the hottest properties in, in football now. You know what I mean? And we, we, we've all kind of seen this happen. So I remember when he went back to Newcastle and it was a whole debate whether he's worth £2 million. I don't think anybody would, anybody would, you know, second guess that now. You know what I mean? But, but, but how far he's come. In the last year, even is it's unbelievable. I mean, t- two years ago, I was one, I wasn't even one at Celtic. I just didn't rate the guy. Um, as you, the usual fan, jumping to conclusions early, to make snap judgments. But the guy, you know, as I would, I would agree with Jason. I would take him before that the bonus, like, ability wise, honestly. Well, that's all got to be done. That that's obviously a lot, well, not all of that, but the majority of that's down to Stevie Woods. The one thing I do love, I've said this before, is that whenever he pulls off a great save or he saves a penalty. If you ever see shots of the, of, of the quick shot of the dugout or whatever, all all, all the, the management staff are patting Stevie Woods in the back. You know what I mean? Because obviously he's putting in a serious amount of work with this guy. Mm-hmm. You know? And that's that's one of the most satisfying aspects for me, just to see a guy come on like that. And it's, it's the same with your Wanyamas, even though Wanyama was more of a product when he arrived. But, I mean, to see him now, I mean, he, he, obviously we're, we're expecting to lose him now in the summer. But, I mean, like, you're, you're, I think you're, you're, you're looking at a future world player there. Who we can all kind of look at and say, well, we've seen him play, and he started with Celtic, you know? The, the thing with the Stevie Woods thing is, I think it's because it's a, the goalkeeper's union, if you like, it's a small group of players at the club who often will go over and do drills on their own with just with Stevie Woods. So it's much more personal thing for Stevie Woods. They are, he's got his own wee team, if you like. But if you want to say Mialbe and Lennon of the squad, Stevie Woods has maybe three or four players that he's really, really concentrating on. So it's probably it's a much more personal thing, and he probably feels much more involved when when uh, Fraser Foster does something good, like you know what I mean? Yeah, I, th- I think as well because Foster wasn't anywhere near the finished article when he came. Yeah, and Stevie Woods, <clears throat> he's going to take a lot of credit for making him into the goalkeeper that he's became. Okay. Right. But, the, uh, the, but then again, I mean, is there a chance at this level of sort of success, this level of you know? Progress with a lot of our players might lead to us losing not only players but backroom staff as well. Um, well, there's a wee rumor at the minute. Well, that's, a, that, that's 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 kind of what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> I mean, do we go ahead and talk about that, or we just leave it? I might mean, as well. That's all I do. It. It's been on another podcast. All right, so let's let's get the full gist of it, right? Fill us in there, Harper. Oh well, I don't have the full gist of it, but what I was told on Sunday, and everybody at Celtic Park seemed to be talking about it, was the fact that. Um, Johan Mialbe has already told his, his his kids' school that he would be taking the kids to that school and he wouldn't be back and he was he was leaving Scotland for good. So whether that's true or not, as what I was told was the Celtic Underground podcast <coughs> had, had broke this story first. Um, whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. I just that's what I was told at the park on Sunday, and everybody seemed to be just taking this as common knowledge. So there you go. Mm. And does that fuel the rumours about Neil Lennon? It does. Well, it does. It, it, obviously, it does. I mean, um, Wait, can, let, let's 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 go down to that first then, right? Jason, you, you're an Everton fan, right? Um, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, a Celtic, I'm a Celtic fan. No, you're a Celtic. You're an Everton fan as well. You, 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 you go to Everton games. You I, I like Everton, but come on, I'm a Celtic fan. You're a Celtic fan, but you're an Everton fan as well. You've got yeah, you've got Ever- like- Everton leanings. Ah, but, yeah. Well, let's say big leanings towards Everton as well, right? You're, you're a Celtic fan first and foremost. The reason I'm saying to you and them is because you would have a better insight to Everton fans and the club and stuff like that, right? Um, right. F- first of all, what, what did you make of the, the rumour when you first heard it? And what have you heard, sort of... Because I've always... I know you keep in con- pretty close contact with, with Everton fans and you talk all the time. You had the guy you've done the podcast member of the Everton fan but uh, Everton that so I know you go down the game still and you talk to people what, what is the feeling in Liverpool about, about Neil Lennon the rumours and 
just basically you take away your side and what you think and what you've heard? Um, well, to be honest with you, they're, they're like us. They don't know. You know, they, they, they don't know what's going on. You know, they're just just normal supporters that's... Uh, they just hear rumours the same as us, you know, unless you're in the know. But uh, would they be want Neil Lennon? Some of them would, some of them wouldn't they? A lot of them, a lot of them would obviously not rate it because it's Scottish football. But uh, a lot of them, a lot, they would all give him a chance, you know. And uh, but I, I actually say it's an interesting thing to them. <laughs> and they, they took it food for thought. I says, being honest with you, I says, I wouldn't swap Davy Moyes for Neil Lennon. Because mm-hmm. Davy Moyes is a loser, Neil Lennon's a winner. David Moyes has never won anything in his managerial career, about 15 years. Uh, Neil Lennon's a perennial winner. He's won everywhere he's been. So uh, I would rather have Neil Lennon than David Moyes. But to see on that and expand on that then, do you think that is the attraction, I thought this sounded like an obvious statement, but do you think that's the attraction for it, maybe for everyone when they look at Neil Lennon, that he is a winner, but he's a winner with a guy, as a guy who's not had a budget uh, to speak of to spend certainly certainly he would spend maybe some of the money Everton or I mean it's the sort of kind of budget we probably Everton if you like what had it sell to is that maybe the sort of thing they would be looking at a guy who can win stuff and be successful in Europe because obviously the European pedigree is the is the yardstick that they would probably measure him measure him on and is it, would that be the, maybe the attraction there uh, potentially but I don't even know if there is any interest in him you know, right. I don't, I don't, I don't know, but, but it's just so hard. P- p- potentially, ah, uh, you could be right, but the same, the same would go for a lot of Everton fans would be skeptical because, like, well, Watty the Cardigan, he's the worst manager in their history, yeah. you know, and he came with a winning pedigree for Scotland, so they would be a wee bit, I don't know, but at the end of the day, Everton have got, they've got a great support, and whoever, whoever manager that hopefully Dither and Bill chooses a decent one, but the fans' choice would be Michael Loudrop or the Porto manager. That's who they would be looking for, but I think Loudrop's got a ten million buyout clause or whatever. A lot of them are Nikin and uh, Martinez, but uh, I don't know. I mean, there Sean Maloney's just equalised for Wigan away to Arsenal. There just a four half time. So what, what, about, drun- what about Drunken Duncan? Is he not getting oh. the job? No. <laughs> 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 so that's what's been buzzing today. I think I know. I think... Stubbs is getting mentioned and stuff like that. At the end of the day, Everton will take a cheap route. That's what I'm sure. Of. So I don't know how much they'd need to pay Celtic for Neil Lennon or whatever. I think if Neil Lennon could come in a package with John Park, they'd probably bite the hand off you. But I think Everton's got a good youth policy as well. They bring loads of their young players through too. So Can, can, I, can I take it a wee bit of a different direction then maybe and ask Paul, what, what do we think, and of course this is just us speculating as fans, right? what do we think would be the attraction for Neil Lennon to go to Everton and leave a club like Celtic? Well, I mean... <clears throat> Leo Lennon's intelligent enough to know is no matter how many fans love him right now if we didn't get a Champions League next season a lot of fans will want him to go that's mm-hmm. just the nature of the beast to play devil's advocate you could argue the team have played like you know Neil Lennon's going to go in the last six months you know they've played like a team that looks like they're losing their manager and they didn't really give a toss so every every Celtic manager has a certain shelf life and people could say well Neil stay for 10 in a row and we'll be getting this that next thing who knows how what his stock will be next season? His stock's as high as it's ever going to be, in my opinion, right now. And he might just be looking at that chance and saying, you know what, this might give me the chance to be, actually go and do something. And I also think, as I, as I say on numerous occasions, I think people have forgotten too often how much Neil Lennon has to go through to be selling manager. Yeah. And you just kind of wonder how long you'll keep putting his partner Irene and the family through that. You know, whereas, you know, they could go to somewhere doing England and kind of have a much quieter life. The flip side of that, of course, is that Neil Lennon's one of us, um, and it was kind of, it's kind of, I heard something when they were talking about Rooney potentially leaving Man United, and they said, you know, we should have a long, hard think about that before he even thinks about trying to do it, and I think Neil Lennon will probably do that in the summer, have a long, hard think about, they actually want to leave this club, you know what I mean, because, let's face it, you're guaranteed uh, at least probably another two leagues in a row before you've even got any kind of threat to anyone. And that would probably be doubled if we actually do get in the Champions League and get enough thirty million pounds coming out of the club. So, sorry. No, I'm just so I think it's it's a fifty fifty thing. But I think if Neil Lennon was to leave, I'd completely understand why. And to be honest, I did not think it would be for football reasons. I, I agree because it was the one thing that struck me when the <clears throat> the players were on the park uh, after the game, didn't they? The lap on and that, and all of the kids on them. 
mm. Neil, was, Neil Lennon's son was, was walking around with him and, and he's at an age now where he's, he's going to be an age at school where things will probably start to affect him and he'll start yeah. being more uh, more open to, to things that have mm. gone on in the media and how, how, how his dad is treated if you like mm -hmm. um, whereas he should be adulated in this in, well, I'm saying this company I'm an island he should be adulated in Scotland and he's he, probably it could be a thing that's big in Neil Lennon's mind it is obviously the family side of things because of the stuff that happens away for football that, that hasn't mm -hmm. happened in the past and I think that's probably one of the, the big part in it. If, if there is if there has been any contact sort of thing but as I say we're only speculating but it is one of the things that I really thought about when I watched them that the age his son is now he's, he's grown up a wee bit and uh, some of the definitely I think would be at for, uh, forefront of his, his mind or decision making uh, I would I I think if ever Murray offered him the job, I think he would go definitely because mm -hmm. I don't think he would get a bigger club. Uh, and and the bigger club, I don't mean that in the sense that Celtic's a bigger club than Everton, but by default, Everton's bigger mm -hmm. because they play in the Premier League. You know, and it's it's just one of the things. And he's 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 not going to get Man United, Arsenal, Chelsea, yeah. uh, Man City. So Everton is the next tranche of clubs, and they're as Aye. big a club as you would sort of get pulled. That's that's my Aye. sort of no, thing. I, yeah. I think that's exactly what happened with Moyes. I think when Moyes took the Everton job, he knew he was never going to get a, a club bigger than Everton. And you know he went in there, Everton was struggling to pay. Obviously, he'd just been through the horrific Smith era. And you know Moyes is kind of went in with that kind of pedigree, sort of war stuff and stuff like that. It's perceived, and you know he's built Everton. I mean, I know there's. It's kind of a funny one. I, I kind of see that I always say that if Miami were going for a manager, Moyes would be the guy they'd go for because it's a gamble. Because like everybody sees, the thing you see against Moyes is, oh, he's no one in it, right? But we could be sitting here for a year for him and he could be a league winner of medal, he could have won the Champions League and maybe shit. You know what I mean? And, yeah. um, and I think that probably, and this is just for an outsider opinion, the, the, the Wigan defeat probably turned a lot of Everton fans against Moyes and thought maybe this is the time for him to go now and that kind of thing. But um, Neil Lennon, to me, is like Moyes. You know, he, he doesn't take any nonsense. He, you know, he drives own players. As you say, he's worked on their budget. We've seen previously Everton haven't got that much money. But if you're ever going to go to the Premiership, it's going to be this summer because this is when they're going to get the big influx of cash for the new TV deal. And Ken Wright himself has said, we've got a great financial package to kind of offer. And you show... You know just how much money's floating about when I believe Moyes is on four million quid. And he's, only grand a week. Six at Man Aye, and he's only gone up to six at Man United, which by by we need a face, but obviously Man United's a far bigger club. So Aye, I know, I know. That's the money you're talking about, you know. The thing, the thing with Mikel, Mikel Arteta took a wage cut to go to Arsenal. He was on mm. their money at Everton. So they, they pay good wages, you know. <laughs> it's this, this myth that they're a poor club and they've no money. All right, in the grand scheme of things, sitting next to Man United and Man City, they're skint, but <laughs> they're no skint in relative terms. I'll always be like, a, the top, in the top five in England. Clubs, no. Ah, Man United, Arsenal, Fulham, Everton. That was, that's the top five. Bank England, right. the last thing I You know, what, I mean, let's be, fair, let's be brutally honest here. You wouldn't need to do really can and get somebody in there with serious money and then there won't be a full signal. Aye, I know, but it's the stadium and things like that. But for Lennon, for a club, for I mean, he would, if he if it's a success down there, you know, an idol for life. So I mean, look at the reception they gave Moyes and the one he offered them. But a lot of Everton fans are realists as well, you know. They they they, they realise they're not going to win much, you know. But they wouldn't mm. mind a wee Carling Cup. Aye, but you see which, on Saturday, I know that West Ham game. I mean, there's nothing to play for really. The atmosphere was absolutely electric. I know, I know. I they look what for the same goal, you know? They love their Fitba and uh, they're just real fanatical support. Very very similar to Celtic fans in many ways, you know. They just they they love their club and uh, they're just ever diehards, you know, and it's they, they just want a wee bit of success. No too much, just a wee bit. But um they just try to, but then the day, as I've said, if Leo Lennon goes to Everton, Moyes isn't the benchmark, Howard Kendall and Harry Catrick are the benchmark. Because Moyes, Moyes didn't deliver them any trophies. He, he done okay for them. And uh, a lot of folk would maybe disagree with us. But I think Ever should be winning the odd trophy. I'm not saying they should be winning the league. That's out of their reach with the money that's getting spent in Uber. So, will Neil go? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, once his speech after the game, he said, I'll see you at the cup final. That to me was a bit... You know, he didn't say, I'll see you next season. Uh, but I think he did in another speech. Who knows? He'll, he, Neil Lennon's no daft. He's a clever guy. So... At the end of the day, if something, some offer doesn't get made to him that's 
I don't think he's going to get a step up for Celtic. I think a step. Most people leave Celtic don't go on to success. You know, most most people that leave Celtic take a step down. They may be going to make more money, but they won't have the level of success. And you can imagine, like I don't know, say say Leicester City or whatever, what they're talking about, sniffing about them. Maybe they could go in there and double his wages, treble his wages, but. In a professional capacity, we're going to be punching our way in the Champions League. Leicester City are going to be languishing in the middle of the Championship. I don't know. Can I, can I fling another tiny wee thing out there when you're talking about oh, uh, oh, Lennon's oh. speech there? Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, this, and obviously it was the second speech he made in a, in a, in a matter of fortnight. The speech he made the, the, the week, the, well, the, when the, the day we clinched the Championship, and he, and he came right out and thanked the Green Brigade and said the Green Brigade in the speech, which would kind of go uh, maybe longer, uh, the, maybe the opposite of the view of the club. Uh, the way he came out and mentioned the Green Brigade so adamantly, if you like, and we know he'd done that the season before he took the trophy over, but we kind of know we, we know what's been going on with the club and, and certain things with the Green Brigade. And when he came out and mentioned that, I, thought, I didn't think that was a wee bit strange in the day. I heard that speculate in other podcasts that he was inst- he would probably have been instructed to do that by the, by the, by the PLC, which I thought, I didn't, I didn't get that at all. I uh-huh. think and Neil Lennon's his own man and he would have uh-huh. come out with that off his own back. But I did maybe think to myself then, when these rumours started coming out, that maybe that's another wee... There's another wee sign that, well, I'm not going to be here, so I'll just I'll be saying what I want, if you like. I don't know. You know what I'm getting at. I didn't well, think me... that. Sorry, Paul, on you go. No, I'm just going to let... <clears throat> I'm only I thinking back to that. I didn't, I didn't think mm-hmm. that at the time. I'm only thinking back to that sort of now in the last few days. Like, well, let, me, let me try and further this on, because this is what I've heard to be absolutely tremendous sources, that uh, Owen Coyle's been the guest uh, say, like, three times in the last six months at Selig Park and in Turin. He's got two kids at Glasgow University who are uh, now up there. His wife's desperate to come back to Glasgow. And, most importantly, he met Dermot Desmond in the Dorchester in 2009 to discuss the job that Mowbray eventually got. And he didn't take the job because he told he wasn't getting a budget unless he had to sold players. And Coyle turned down the job on the basis that he's been a Celtic fan, he didn't want to mess, mess it up, and he was going to take his chance. He recently turned down the Blackpool job, um, which is a pretty decent job for somebody like him at the moment. So, it kind of feels like if Lennon was to go, then it's a bit like O'Neill and Strachan, the replacement's already been told just to bide his time. You know, that's the kind of things I'm hearing. Mm. Aye. Joel, I'd Joel, th- you're pretty quiet. What's your take on us? I just wanted to bring in Terry O'Neill here. Terry's called that. He's been sitting here on the lane for about five, five t- nearly ten minutes. Terry, you there? Oh, how you doing, guys? Just sort of listening with interest. You all right, uh, Terry? All right, Terry. To speak. Um, I've been keeping a low profile recently. Uh, cutting legs off my bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just saw Neil Lennon in the, in the Everton situation. Um, I was at the Bond Test um, Homba Club the other night last Friday when uh, Phil McGill- McGillivan, um, Paul McConville, and uh, Paul Brennan, the Celtic Quick News, were like, hosting a question and answer. Um, and a, an interesting point came up. It might have been Paul Brennan that said that. Um, and he, what he said was that the English Premiership, the position that the league and in, in the league that the, the, the teams finish in, invariably is dictated by the, uh, the, the 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 budget in terms of wages. And he says there's only two teams that tend to buck that trend. One is, one is Newcastle. They underperform based on the wages that they pay. But interestingly enough, Everton is the club that are probably a couple of positions higher than what um, their budget or what their spend would dictate compared to the rest of the league. And what comes to, comes to that then is that Moyes is doing a job that's better than what you would expect. So where Moyes is going to fill a, a big pair of shoes, I think Neil Lennon is on a high into nothing going into Everton. Because if they drop a couple of places, the pressure's immediately on. And I know traditionally one in anything. And I've had a guy in place, David Moyes, who, according to the stats, is doing a good job in terms of the wage bill he's on. But hasn't he actually won anything? So I, I think... I I think I, to be honest with you, Terry, there's a right job. 
there's other stats out there as well because that's that's wrong what they've said because Aston Villa's got the seventh highest wage bill and they they're only avoiding relegation, so they're majorly underperforming. There's quite a few I different mean, stats. There. I, I, I mean, they're oh, a span right. of time. That, that's right. what they said. They're a span of time. I, I couldn't back it up either way. Uh, so I've not looked into it, but that's what that's what was mentioned. Aye. But anyway, even if that's even if that's shite, even if that's rubbish, Moyes has never won anything at Everton, and but he's Aye. been there, and for Neil Lennon to go in, whoever goes in will be expected to at least maintain that position. If they start going down the way, then the pressure's on to to get rid. So I think Neil Lennon's in a position at Celtic. He's guaranteed to win the league for the next few seasons. I agree with Paul Arkin when he says his star's not going to be any higher because realistically, the last 16 um, is, is about as good as it gets for us. Um, uh-huh. Realistically, okay, we'll, 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 we'll aspire to doing better than that, but realistically, that collection of players that we've got to know, are we going to be able to repeat that? Are we going to be able to keep the likes of Hooper, Big Vic, and or get replacements of a similar quality? In the market, we, we shop in two million market young players. I mean, yeah, okay, John, John Parks did it so far. Are we going to be able to repeat it? So, I, I would say, Neil, when everything, no, if I was Neil, Lennon, obviously, as State Celtic, uh, well, no matter who, what, the, what the job offer was, and uh, I, I would stay Celtic, and I think Neil Lennon's better off at Celtic. Um, I think he should stay until he gets sacked, basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you made a fair point, you know, and as I say, Everton's a step down for Celtic, you know, they're nowhere near as big a club as Celtic, but just because they play in that league. And you know, managers, that they always believe they can take it to the next level. I mean, David Moyes has obviously stepped into Ferguson's shoes. How's he going to live up to that? But who knows? I just think maybe the hassle and the goldfish bowl and stuff like that, maybe. But Neil Lennon's thrived in it for years, so at the end of the day, this isn't anything new to him. So you might be right. I am. I mean, also, the also in the, I heard Paul saying about um, Oni Coyle. Um, my brother-in-law is quite close to somebody that is quite close to Oni Coyle. And he said that the last time the job was on offer, it was Coyle's wife that didn't want to come up the road because of the sectarian aspect of the job. She thought there would be too much, the hassle associated with being much more than what it's worth. Now, I know the guy who said this to my brother-in-law, and unless he's telling my brother-in-law shite, that was what was told at the time. And this guy would know, don't want to say who the guy's name, but um, he told it to my brother-in-law that that was a reason. And this guy would know. That's what I'm saying. Is his but, wife English? She's no, I, don't, I think his wife's Scottish. Oh, oh, right, right, okay. But, right. but it was a family thing. They didn't want... She thought... I don't know whether it was maybe the age of the kids or whatever. She thought they will want that hassle. Maybe right. it's changed, but that, that that's what I was told at the time is why he didn't come. It wasn't a day with budget, but right. then again, who... who Who's to say? I mean, you hear rumours and. Oh, I know. I think, I think though, I think though, if that was the case, and, and she would maybe be able to look at it now and see that Scottish football and manager Celtic could be a slightly different climate without Celtic going league. Yeah. Because they didn't have they didn't have those those games every year and stuff like that. Plus, his circumstances are different now. He's got a job. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a big circumstance. Aye, I know, I know. But the, the thing is, see with Celtic, at the end of the day, if Lenny does decide to go, he'll go wherever his best wishes and we'll just mm-hmm. move on, you know. At the end of the day, of Celtic's, Celtic's too big for us to worry about managers and egos and whatever like that. But, I mean, we've had better managers than Lenny in the past than we've got on with. So the bottom line is, if he goes, he'll go wherever his best wishes and I'll always look out for his results wherever he goes because of what he done for us and what he put up with as a Celtic manager because it's, that's never been done before the sort of crap that he's put up with in this society but uh, I, I, I've got a feeling he might stay myself you know and I, I, the other thing that it, it might be a, it might be being a bit cute as well Lenny I don't know what stage he's negotiating in terms of getting a new contract with that, with that. but if, if let's say he's looking for a longer term rather than this year rolling contract which is, a, is the traditional thing with Celtic let's say he's looking for a bit more Security, and then he, he he can make it. Uh, he, Aye, he, he's he's hot in the cards. Like he, he he could make he could make it to Lawwell. Uh, so they see the doubt in Lawwell's mind that look, I'm in demand here. Everything 
Yeah. No, no, like dispel the rumours, but just like go along with them. And that that comment of sees at the Scottish Cup final, that, that might have been calculated. But I don't know. I don't know his personalities. I don't know if that's the kind of guy he is. But that when I heard that, I did think, well, why would they not sell C's next season? And then maybe sometimes we read we read too much. I think it just Aye, but, but it's a, next week. That's, cup final that's, and that's it. That's a fair point, Terry. I mean, what's what's Lenny having the idea what his wages are? But when he came to Celtic, he wouldn't have been on top dollar, you know, and I don't think Celtic would pay it. So when you're looking at David Moyes getting 60 grand a week with Everton, say Lenny's on, I don't know, 15 or 20 or 15. A better offer? You never know, that's what the audio. Well, I think as well, a lot of these things like See the likes you see Rooney have, haven't put a transfer in. What I think's happening there, and again I'm just speculating, but he's obviously known, Alec Ferguson's known for a while he's leaving, so they've in the background s- s- sounded doing Moyes. Moyes has said, I okay, I'll go. And then of course, Rooney, he, he gets sued with Moyes for writing about him in his book, so I don't know about how much bad blood's here. But it's better if a player says, I want to leave, rather than Moyes coming in and saying, I want to sell you. So maybe the situation has been that Ferguson's told him, look, David Moyes is going to be taken out here. What do you think about that? He's like, I'm fucking off. And, um, and put his transfer request in. And it, it's just a bit of managing a, a situation. So that might be why the, the way it's been done. Um, I think so Ferguson what, definitely what grew Moyes. is that, Although we get to hear Ferguson's retired and he's finishing the Moyes, these things have all maybe been fucking sorted out months ago in terms of sounding people out and saying, look, would you come and you don't know what's going on in the background. So when they're when they surprise me if like Everton have approached sell, uh, Neil Lennon approached half a dozen other ones because you don't want to be left in a situation where you know your manager's going but you've not got a fucking replacement. Right. So... Uh, there's a lot goes on in the background that are no privity, obviously. I, I, I think you're spot on with the Man United thing there. They're such a big business as a football club, massive business. This has probably all been in the main for months. I almost certainly have. Mm. Uh, he's he's groom boys for that, Joe, but I think you're giving oh. Bill Kenwright too much credit. He's a dithering clown. I don't think he'll have him. <laughs> he looked shell shocked when boys walked out. He's must be, no, must be the only one that couldn't see it. <laughs> See when you yeah, mentioned yeah. that. See when you mentioned that earlier on, Terry, about like you know me- measuring up the you know the, the wage bill with performance. You gotta ask yourself though: Is Neil Lennon the kind of person that's gonna step into like, uh, like say? I mean, I don't want to call Everton a mid-table club, but I mean like you know not not a top four club in the English Premiership. And is that gonna be enough for him? Is that gonna be an incentive to take a job? Or he's basically well, just that, he's, he's got to balance I mean, he's wages. Not hiding nothing. Um, okay, it's a Premiership, and if he can do well, then. It's a stepping stone to greater things, and maybe that's the way he's looking at it. But for me, in Europe with Celtic, you, do, you can't get much better than that. That's exactly. I mean, that, that that that's progress to be made season after season. And you go to somewhere yeah, like you go to somewhere like Joe, Everton, and I mean, Joe, you're trading what? You, trading water? No. Joe, we could be in Europe in July. Then what happens? That's true. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's got. You can't he just say, "Oh, he's guaranteed this and that." Celtic. He's only hiding anything at Celtic, or not. I know, but and you could, and you could, win the league. I know, but at least the opportunities there. You know what I mean? You could look at this season as well, and he, could he look at the beating Barcelona at home and getting to the last sixteen? Is that going to be the pinnacle of Europe for Celtic? Because as Terry said, the last sixteen is realistically our target, a realistic target every year. Like, and I think, I honestly think it will come. Down, a big part of it, as we mentioned earlier, a big part of it will come down to non-football issues as well, and it'll be family issues and stuff that goes on in Scotland. Mm. Aye, I'm getting dished out bans for the FSA, the, the, the FSA, the, the SFA for saying fanny and stuff like that. I mean, they must be saying to yourself, what, is, what, what can I need to do up here? But uh, I don't know. I just. Who knows? Um, keep an open mind. If he wants to stay, brilliant. If he wants to go, he goes with the best wishes. That's, that's, that's my opinion on it as well. Because it's just what can, what can we do? We're just fans, and uh, <laughs> we know nothing. This is true. Um, I don't know, but, but it's, it's, would you be concerned if he left? That's the question. I suppose. I mean, would you be concerned who was coming in afterwards? I mean, I see lads in the chat room there now saying, "No, no, not coil, not coil." I mean, would you be concerned if he left that the next person going to come in and make an absolute bollocks of it? 
you're always got that concern. Right. Right. Obviously, right. obviously, was that the concern? But I mean, like you know, well, obviously it depends on who. Like, say, say we did at least if, if he left this summer, right? Obviously, it would, it would it would be a case of how many players you manage to keep then in the summer. I mean, because there's a part of me thinks that there are there are players that are staying there because of Neil Lennon. You gotta, again, you, yeah. you, you, you gotta give him that sort of respect. You know, I mean, there's Ambrose come out today and says that you know. Neil Lennon is, is the inspiration behind the team and you can tell by the likes of Joe Ledley and Adam Matthews they respect him you know what I mean there's players like that that will stick around because well, of Neil Lennon see, see, can I take you back to when Neil Lennon got the job right and the and the managers that were being touted for the position and uh, I've, I would have no reason to believe that it would be any different this time around and I think at the time Neil Lennon was the only choice for me but the guys who were being touted in the press the likes of your Mark McGee and stuff like that uh, that, that would be my concern. Would be we would just go in for a budget manager, and know someday. I mean, we got a budget manager if you like in Neil Lennon, but it was a budget that we could accept because of who Neil Lennon is and what he means to us. Aye, and what, Aye. put it this way: imagine we lost the Scottish Cup final at Hibs next week. There'd be a lot of Celtic fans who would want rid of him. I'll get Aye. Pat Fenlon. In. <laughs> you know. At least the worst in Pat Fenlon would do me after his comments about James Connolly at the weekend. What did they say? Seemingly, I know I heard about it. They were saying, uh, I was getting told on Sunday that he uh, dedicated the win against Harps to, to James Connolly on the anniversary, on the anniversary of James Connolly's death. I, I, I met a young girl whose friend, who actually lives next door to him, who lives next door to where he used to live in Dublin. The, uh, the other week there in a school like, like, we have this thing where we're in the class and say have you met anybody famous and one of them is Pat Fenlon I says what hey, you met Pat Fenlon he says oh he lives next door to me uh, um, well, that's seemingly that's at the weekend I don't know what programme radio station or whatever it was but he, he dedicated Hibs win against Hearts to the memory of James Connolly <laughs> Sunday there you go. Tell me, let me ask this question right? if Neil Lennon did leave right, and the likes of Owen Coyle come in would we lose something as, as supporters in the stands, would, would we lose something in terms of supporting the team? Obviously, you're going to support Celtic no matter no matter what, 100 percent, right? But will we lose that type of edge that we had a guy in there that's just like us? You know what I mean? In terms of like, he's, he's an Irish Catholic, whatever. I mean, he, he, he's sort of it's in his blood. You know what I mean? Would well, we? Well, 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 I know, but I mean, but Owen Coyle, but Owen Coyle never played for Celtic, and Owen Coyle never. I know, but I tell you what, I, I could tell you guys in the goggles right now would argue Owen Coyle was a bigger fan than Neil Lennon ever was. I have to say, you're the only other Irish Catholic on the shows. I know you're on about. I know. I was halfway through saying that, and I realised it. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, do you think? I know, we, I know, we I know what you're getting at. I don't. His own, his own Coyle's one of us. You know, what I mean? I, I, Jason. I think what Joe's trying to think is right. And the eyes they may be outside their support as well, on the other side of the city. Neil Lennon represented someone to the Celtic sport, if you know what I mean, because he'd been the club captain and because of the sort of tussles he's had with the other side and the tussles he's had with the SFA. And I think he kind of gave us a, a banner cause to get behind yeah, because, yeah. He's, because of what he represented. I, I think that, Joe, I understand. Yeah, that's well, the, the, the supporters. I, know, I, I get a, Owen Coyle would have that. Yeah, well, Owen, saying Owen Coyle could be anybody. And we all know he's a Celtic man. And he probably grew up a bigger Celtic fan than Neil Lennon. I get all that. But yeah, I think Neil Lennon does represent a certain thing to the Celtic support because of, because of where he was as a, as a captain and the things he's went through off the park with the bombs and the bullets and all that kind of stuff. And we all rallied behind Neil Lennon. And I think, you, of course, you've always that sort of excitement. Yeah, I, I, I don't think M, the M, they would want to replace that. You, you know, know what that's. You know, you know what Joe's getting. At, I, 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 like I, do, I do, but at the end of the day, I. It's a bit, do we lose some? I don't think we as a support lose anything. You know, oh. we just move on to the next manager. You know, it's, it doesn't matter who it is; they'll get our support until mm, things right. turn sour or whatever. But no, you take, you, take, you take care of that very simply by winning football matches. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's exactly it. it. Yeah. yeah. So no was the answer then. <laughs> so so I was just just shocked. More pish. <laughs> so what, what if we get Stuart McCall? <laughs> oh Christ! Don't be starting that. Um, I, can, I, can, I can always stick to draw him. Yeah. Did anybody find that strange? Stuart McCall got the manager of the year. Oh really? No. To be fair, I think he deserved it. I don't know. If didn't hat on time, but he sort of established Motherwell as the second best team in Scotland, and he's had no money whatsoever to spend. I think he's done an amazing job. But done. obviously, somebody made the point that he didn't uh, he didn't have to give up his 12 points to Sevco every season because they're doing a few leaks. So that helped him out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I like that. 
<laughs> uh, makes sense. Um, well, I, I, I personally, I thought it was going to be Bomber Brown. So <laughs> I, I thought he'd do hey, it. Terry, what do you think of that one about McCall Gunner? What do you think? I always think these things come up. <clears throat> Usually when I say I have won the league, it's as if it's uh, to try and deflect our face it. Celtic's championship that they, they take on an importance when they're really only trinkets or they, they don't really matter a fuck to me it's just that uh, the, the obvious choice is Neil Lennon because of the last 16 for me the last the European Cup's the only show in town and everything else pales into significance I could understand maybe if we get knocked out of the Champions Cup Win the league, somebody else in Scotland gets it because of league position. But when our managers got us to the last 16, beat Barcelona, got an away one in Europe for the first time, to me, there's no other contenders. And it's just a combination of fucking blatant bias. Uh, and I see. Knows what it is, personality clashes. But I, I, I don't think it matters that much. As long as we win the league, these are just trinkets. Aye. I suppose I, I, I agree. Wouldn't they look after if they just gave everything to Celtic? I suppose at the end of the season. Well, I mean, put it this way: if, if we win nothing next season, I'll guarantee you none of our players getting any awards. That's true. Uh, yeah, everybody else is never won when our beans getting all the awards this season. Aye. So <laughs> that's true. I mean, <laughs> the two teams that have won trophies in Scotland this season so far, Celtic and London, nobody any recognition whatsoever. Uh, celebrate mediocrity in this country. Aye. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, they're, they're trying to pump up the game, but I mean, Celtic and Neil Lennon made the world football set up and take notice of Scotland. Mm. Yeah. I mean, this season. So I mean, if if you're going to award, I mean, depends on what kind of merits you're awarding these these sort of things on. I mean, personally, for me, you'd say, well, who's helped? Who's done the best job with their team this season? Who who's elevated their team to, to a status that nobody saw? And that's that's got to be Neil Lennon. You know what I mean? See, see, to be honest, my own personal. I don't know about what the rest is, but. I, I pay a lot of attention to the player of the year and the manager oh, of the year. I'm, I'm the same. I'm the I same. I couldn't have cared less. I don't know, maybe maybe the players, I think probably the players, the players' player uh, uh, one is maybe something that would mean to uh, mean something to a player because he's getting voted by his fellow pros sort of thing. I can get behind the idea of that, but as a supporter, I, I just couldn't have cared less about it, to be honest. I know, there's a reason to grape. That's what, that's what this show's all about. Uh, use Irish Catholics, she's not the same. <laughs> Seeing back to Neil Lennon's, Lennon and reasons to stay at Celtic, um, I think whoever's the manager at Celtic, I hope it is Neil Lennon that stays, I think they've, they've got an opportunity, we've not really seized it this season, but I, I think there's an opportunity to try and develop a, a recognisable style of play at Celtic that's based on playing the game at pace and this year our domestic form suffered because we've been in an unusual situation that we knew we would win the league before a ball was kicked. We weren't going to have much competition. So human nature being that as guys lacking off, they make poor passes that maybe don't go into a challenge when they've got a European game coming up and there's a sloppiness creeps into play and it manifests in the European tie with FA. Ambrose getting caught twice in the bar, caught sleeping, we lost two goals. To me, guy like that, guy Jim McGuinness, or guys like that, where you look at performance and look at how you try and improve, I think we've got an opportunity here going forward to look back at that season and say, well, okay, we did, we did brilliant, but what did we know they so good? What, what could we improve on? And there's no doubt in terms of entertaining the fans. I mean, you saw it there at the weekend, the potential that team's got, the blue at St. Johnson after the park. Yeah. And to me, that's a, that's a standard you should be aiming for. Not you just day enough to get through the game. To me, I want to go back to the days when if you didn't play well, you get dropped out of the team. We've got too many players that are guaranteed their place nigh on fucking every week. Um, yeah. And I'll cite Joe Ledley as one of them. He played well at the weekend. Joe Ledley involved in the game is what I want to see. I don't want to see Joe Ledley that I go, is he actually fucking playing here? Uh, and to me, I, I picked him out. That's a bit unfair, just to single one guy out. But I just use that as an example. I, I want to see Celtic going forward where the performance side of things 
Hopkins has looked at with a fine tooth comb and the mental side of the game because it's definitely these players have got it, there's no question. But it's that mental side that makes them slack slack enough because they can slack enough. But we should develop a culture where that's not acceptable, where you've got to strive to be the best. Strive to put the ball into the, the guy that's in mid stride running forward and see the behind him. Control the ball first time. Play the game at pace. You make more mistakes, but and the reason I say we've got an opportunity is because of the fact that we're going to win the league. You can take chances and and just to explain, just come out up front with the fans and say this is the way we're going to play the game, this is the way we're going to strive to play the game, we're going to strive to play it at pace. We're going to make mistakes, we've got a young team, so please try and factor that in when you're ready to booze. Um, just be more honest with the fans and, and as I say, try and, try and put something in place that's just mere than one in the league. Try and develop, like, look at Borussia Dortmund, for instance, a different level for us, but they play a game at pace. That's what we should be striving for, to try and better ourselves. So it's a pleasure to get like a Celtic part. A lot of guys have fallen away, different reasons for falling away, financially. The thing is as well, Terry, that breeds as well. See if we are gone at that. You, you mentioned that before. See the first 20 minutes of the game. You know, we used to batter teams. That was our, that was, that was the way we played the game. You know, people had to keep us quiet for the first 20 minutes or it was game over. But lately, team, teams come to say like partner and attack us because they're not frightened us for whatever reason, whether the team isn't motivated, whether, I don't know, they just can't be bothered, whether it was in the back of a European away trip. You know, there was all these excuses bandied about, but it wasn't well, acceptable. There's stuff creating in as well, like in away games. You'll see as we will open up brightly and we'll go one nothing up. But then you can just see it. Aye. They just the, the sit back. The game, and then they lose an equaliser and then it's like fucking panic stations. Yeah, well, earlier on the season, 2 now up to Ross County and get beat 3-2. I mean, you wouldn't you? I mean, what price would that have been in the bookies? Aye. You know, it just... But, but at the end of the day, we still won the league and we did enough, and I suppose it is human nature, but you're right. And now's the time Celtic can create. I'm surprised there's uh, any grass at all in that park at Ross County. Is that windy up there? <laughs> 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 but we, we, we have got an opportunity here, because obviously we are odds-on favourites to win the league, and if only an idiot would bet against us. But we've got a chance, as you say, knowing the, obviously the way Barcelona, but something similar that we can put a mark on and have a team that plays a certain way and you're right, if you don't perform then you're out the team and you don't get back yeah, in until somebody was else that, was, that no, was that no Tony Mowbray's philosophy when he came in? Mm -hmm. You're only going to get a certain amount of time to, to get that right and you're not going to accept it. You've got to get that, you've got to get hit the ground running with that kind of football and it's got to bring immediate success in my opinion to Celtic. That's just the way the fans are. And I think, I think, see the but pressure of qualifying this Champions League. Is, what, what, what I'm saying on that is that because we're going to win the league, you've got that extra bit of leeway. You're not, it's not a case of Rangers are breathing down your neck and you can't afford to drop points. That's, that's disappeared. So what I'm saying is you've got that bit of breathing space where you can like look at playing a game at like high pay and okay you might drop the same amount of points as you dropped this season but people will understand what you're trying to achieve and if I can go back to that Jim McGuinness I don't know if any he's watched the documentary it was on RTE and I watched it on my iPad but I was really impressed with the guy because it didn't tell you exactly what he was doing with each individual player but he'd formulated a set of standards that the guys had to confirm conformity and I think that, that's the kind of thing it's going to be good you've, you've got to have a, a part on the play a, a thing that you're striving for 
And uh, as I said, I was really impressed with him. So I hope he's getting utilised at Celtic much more than just on the youth team. I think there's somebody needed to work on the first team's mental attitude and how, how they approach the game. And I'll, I'll, I'll give them a bit of, I'll cut them a bit of slack because this season has been a bit of a learning curve in terms of, we've never experienced it before, that you're coming out of high-flying games like against Barcelona and then you're going to play teams that you know really if you get beat or you drop points, it doesn't matter. And I know <laughs> it does matter. But I know. What I mean is it doesn't matter. Uh, but Terry, see, Terry, 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 see what you said there when you said if they come out and be honest about it, right, we're going to play this style of football and, and people will understand that. I don't think people will understand that. I think you, any Celtic manager playing any style of football is only three, three defeats away for, for people calling, away, calling for his head. Like. But I, don't, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think... I don't. Playing, playing like that. I, I think we'll, we'll probably teams basically. But, uh, but I just think it's, it's a standard you've got to aspire to. I, I, listen, I totally agree with you. I work, that's the kind of football I want to see Celtic play. And Tony Mowbray came in, and I'm going back to Tony Mowbray, and even when John Barnes came in and he was talking about playing sexy football, I want to see Celtic playing sexy football. And I agree with you, we, we should have the leeway John Barnes uh, the space. <laughs> um, but, but do you know what I mean? I, I, I think it doesn't matter what you tell the fans. If you lose two or three games in a row, that's, that get, forget this football, we need to win games. You know what I mean, I've got to see Celtic to win. And I think that's, that's what will always come down to. That's the way the support is. Yeah, but it's not... A, but often when you say things like this, it's like people, just what you've said, think, well, if you do that, you'll get beat. Why can we not have style and win? Oh, no, I, I completely agree with you. I'm just... stylish football, then there's... No, Terry, beat, I don't think that's no, the case. Terry, Terry, what I'm saying was, you said that what you, your own words was people will understand if you be honest and explain them. What I'm saying is people will only understand if it doesn't work out right straight away. And it's tough to work. It would have to work. You'd have to hit the ground running and tough to work straight away. Because the fans, wouldn't they, wouldn't they accept uh, having to be a build up to something to work? I don't think they would. You're, you're right. I should have rephrased it a bit more. Like, what I think would, it would do is help to manage expectations if you say, look, the chances are we're going to make mistakes in some games because of the speed we're going to try and play it. But please bear ways or try and cut us a bit of slack. I just think there's not enough conversation between the team and Celtic in general and the, and the fans. We're keeping the dark too much. I think it should be much merrier. Like we're all in this together kind of uh, situation, regardless of what kind of subject we're talking about, whether it be the situation with Sevco getting fucking written his ass for 10 years and no a thing getting said, or uh, how we actually play on the park. I think there should be much more honest and straightforward and in your face communication between the club and the support. I wouldn't disagree with any of that. No. I, I, there's, there's no need why there shouldn't be you know see all this because Celtic all, all through the Sevco fiasco never, Celtic never came out and said anything to us you know it was like just, we have to keep my dignified silence or whatever when the you know, there's were. too much I, I was at that thing on Friday night and I was making the point I, I kind of disagreed a wee bit with Paul Brennan because a guy had brought up the point that um, we hadn't said much about the, the verdict, say, Lord Nemo Smith and just the whole general situation. And Paul was saying that Celtic, from a PR point of view, if they did come out and, let's say, called for the header, Campbell Ogilvy, it would be portrayed in the media and twisted in the media to such an extent that it would become a Celtic Rangers thing. So while that's true, what I said to Paul was, I think there's too much of that. I think you should tell the truth and tell tell it as it is. And you can be clever about it. All you need to do is pose questions. Oh, like, we've lost them, God rest them. Uh, that lawyer, I forgot, Paul McBride. Oh, Brad, he'd, he'd have been the type that would have posed a question and he's got that aura about him. He'd have said, how come... Rangers can be fined 
Rangers can be found guilty of 10 seasons of systematic, deliberately flouting the rules. And the chief executive of the SFA was part of that programme. How come that chief executive was still in a job? Pose questions. <laughs> and there's nobody, there's nobody at Celtic. That's, a, that's the way you date. You pose questions, you say, why is this? Why is that? Don't they make statements? You can pose questions. But the, as I said at that meeting, the perception from the Celtic fans is that we've swallowed that. We've swallowed their millions of pounds getting lost. And it's millions of pounds that, that season book holders have, have put in for a, a, a stacked deck tournament and Celtic. There's all this other stuff getting done in the background. The Celtic supporters, as far as we're concerned, the perception and perception is really important, is that Celtic have done nothing and said nothing. And for me, I was watching a thing the other night, I'm going to have a wee tangent, but I'll come back, you know what I'm talking about in a minute. I was watching a thing that was um, about the Challenger spacecraft, and they, they, they got a scientist involved, um, a guy called Richard Feynman, and... Um, if he, if he can get his book, he's a guy's a genius. Um, he's dead now, but um, he get brought in, and it was one of these PR exercises. NATO, NATO, no, sorry, no NATO. NASA had all these guys on this committee, and basically what they wanted to do was cover it up the fact that there was an O ring that that spot and caused these gases to escape, which ignited and caused the and of course, this guy, he's he's no part of it, he's an outsider, so he's coming in with a fresh view, and what he said, there was an appendix to the report, and what he said was that PR shouldn't take the place of truth when, I can't remember his exact phrasing, but in this case, he was talking about nature being involved, nature will always catch you in this, in this place, in this instance, uh, these people lost their lives because of it. He says, so PR should never take the place of that. And I think there's too much where Celtic are thinking about what is their reputation, what is their perception yeah. going to be if we say this. Instead of just calling it as it is and tell the, the truth and stand by it. And that's how we got into all that bother with the poppies as well. Instead of coming out right at the start and saying, look, all this poppy thing is nothing more than a point scoring exercise and we'll not be part of it. We'll not have it on our shirts because we'll, not, we'll contribute to the poppy scheme and we have every respect for the fallen, but we're not taking part in a point scoring exercise. They, they got criticism for it, but they, they had the balls to come out and nip it in the bud. There's, See, the PR guy at Celtic, I'd sack him. He's a Aye. heart supporter, stroke ranger supporter. I'd get a Celtic man in there, get somebody that loves the club and somebody that's honest and You're just right. tell him like it is. See, see the thing about the poppies as well, Terry? There's loads of people in mainstream media now are wearing white poppies. They're actually protesting about it because they're, they're saying, I'm no buying into this shit that's been hijacked with right-wing lunatics. You know, well, Celtic had just come out and said that. Who, who could have held them up? You know, you get the end of the day, just be truthful. And you're right, if you tell the truth, then you very rarely be caught out. And I think, see, see deep down, my views anyway, my views are the sickest people out of all the carry on that happen to the ex Rangers is the Celtic board. I think, I think they're gutted because obviously that dilutes their earning potential. I don't know what you think of that. Yeah. No, it's not oh, right, yeah. from a financial point of view. Aye, I think they were sick. Celtic. And, and, but and at the same time, but the Champions League money's helped us. Uh, it's Aye. made it easier to get to the Champions League, so there's swings and roundabouts. But I just, as I say, be up front, just tell it like it is, and at least get the message out to the support. As I say, the, the supporters are everything about Celtic for me. But yep. they, don't, they don't get treated that way, they get treated as if they're... But I come on, it. In the dark. That's it. Yep. What were you going to say there, Paul, about the... Oh, I'm just going to say, Peter Law will shot himself. It's as simple as that. 
he did the, he did the back the fans at all. His silence allowed the media to condition the public for Rangers to get off of the whole thing. And that's yes. why they got to keep all the trophies. And who gives a f- stuff about the media or that? We're bigger than the media. We're bigger than the Sun. We're bigger than the Daily Record. Any of these, are, they're going to slag us off anyway. You know, as far as I'm concerned, everybody sitting here spending 15, 20 grand watching a big league. And we've, we've not been compensated. We've not been, been given justice. We've not been given anything for it. And I hold Peter Lowell personally responsible for that because he had his finger on the trigger and he never pulled it once. Aye. Yeah. I know his silence was deafening. And it, I mean, at the end of the day, Celtic fans were clamouring just for Celtic to make their position known, but they said nothing. They just sat there back. I can that idea Aberdeen's been saying there. Mm. You know, they put, but. Uh, they, put out a se- they put out a statement, Celtic, after that LNS, and nobody upon pain of death in Scotland could tell you what was in it the day after it was put out. That's how mealy mouthed and fucking weak it was. And right. as I said earlier, we lost millions of pounds and we put out a statement that's like, nobody remembers it. Yeah. And it's got no impact whatsoever. Yeah. Shocking. I know. Uh, well, they're gone now anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see, what's the crack for the final? What do we reckon? Uh, it'll be a nice big green and white festival. We're going to all laugh at Sevco. It's all good. I know. Are we panicking? Are we confident? I'll be panicking if they get beat. I don't even know who Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm looking forward to it because it'll be an occasion. If the Falkirk had been here, it would have been crap. There'd be a no win situation. They'd have brought about 5,000 fans, and that would be that. 50 50 split. It's going to be an occasion. We'll need the outfit to win because they're playing well. They're hungry. And I think if they do win that, it'll be a really good achievement to win the double. Yeah. Aye. Definitely. The obviously we have just beaten me. I think they've got the most one side at City Derby in the world against the right, so for, so for them to win at Tynecastle at the weekend there in the manner that they've done it, they're mm. gonna be absolutely buzzing. You know, and the, the, it's just it's just the thing that, you know, they get pumped off hearts five one in the final last year and then they've got a second bite at the cherry. They're coming no under any pressure because nobody's obviously they've got the pressure they've no won it for bloody about a thousand years. But <laughs> They, they're coming and uh, everybody expects us to win it mm-hmm. and they've got that they've got that uh, I mean the, to me they're probably one of the best players in Scotland playing with them you know he's ah he's what a I think, I think the boy's absolutely fantastic I think what a, what a player he is so anything can happen there, there's one there's a tiny wee bit of me and then I take this the wrong way but because uh, I'll not be good at explaining because I've had a bottle of wine there there's a tiny wee bit of me when you go back to that half five one thing, right? There's a tiny wee bit of me that kind of hang you make touched on it, Jason, a wee bit that maybe this is Hibs's year, if you so to speak, it's their second chance. And there is a if we do get beat for Hibs, there's the only team in Scotland that would want to get beat for in the cup final. And that's no for the for the sort of oh, they're the Edinburgh version of us or anything like that. It's just uh, I'm actually getting pissed off with hearts having it up in them because I hate hearts that much. I'm annoyed with hearts having this over them, like, do you know what I mean? So if we do lose to Hibs, at least it's Hibs, and they, and they can maybe fucking hold their heads up against the pricks for a wee while. Like, if you, do you know what I'm trying to get there? Aye. But I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm desperate for Celtic to win the final. But if it, was to, if it was to go wrong, at least it's Hibs, and at least maybe they'll be able to stick one of our hearts and all that. Uh, at least it's, I, I, I'll take that for it. Uh, absolutely not I'm just no bad at all <laughs> do, you get, do, you, do you get one player coming for no, the top if, if, if they weren't playing us I'd want them to win but I wouldn't have to ask them to get beat I watched the Hibs Hearts final in the pub and uh, I was wanting Hibs to win and stuff like that and after a couple of goals you were like ah well who's round is it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to be honest I couldn't even told you Hibs beat Hearts at the weekend I didn't know I was right. the last score I had was one each I was, oh, busy. I was busy obviously I know right, it's I know, I, I do know what you're saying, and I, but nah, they, you can't. They, they, I don't want them to have their play against us. I, I, th- I think if, if you pushed Hibs fans right now, that deep down they fear a drumming, right? There's no doubt about it, like because they got drubbed at Hamden last year. They almost got drubbed by Falkirk. Deep down they fear a drumming, and I think in the back of Fenland's mind and the players' mind, that's going through them. Certainly, like turn up, we could get annihilated here. And see, what I think Celtic like have today is ensure that that thought never leaves their head. Yeah. Because you see what Hart's done to them, you see what Falkirk have done to them, right in about them, and they were all over them, you know, and the game was finished, apart from Falkirk then collapsed, blah, blah, blah. 
if Celtic go out with that kind of attitude, because Hibs are looking at it, because I'm saying, well, we're not playing that well, says, Aye, but he's always turned up when you really need to. And that that's the thing that they're looking at. And that's what we've got today. And I can kind of, I can't with Harper's going, because I know a lot of good Hibbies who have been yeah. suffering for a year now and all that kind of thing. But under no illusion, I'm looking to annihilate them. <laughs> I, I, I honestly believe we will annihilate them. I think we're going to hand it. I'm dropping them. And part of that is because I think that there is probably a number of players going to be made. That'll be their last game. And right. a Celtic jersey and they'll... And, Probably some of your top players, and you would think as a as a professional player, a cup final. If you thought you were leaving the club, and uh, and they probably have got a, a certain attachment to the club, they'll want to go out with a bang. And I I honestly believe, uh, and we're talking the likes of Gary Hooper. I, I can see Gary Hooper scoring a hat trick in the cup final. If you know what I mean, and going out and leaving that as his legacy. Like, and I can see I think, a few, I think a few players rising on that occasionally. I think I think there might be this so-called Hamden hoodoo. Uh, will act in our favour because they players know that people are doubting them and think they maybe haven't got it and Neil Lennon will know that more than MD so he'll have it rattled right into them and I, I would fully expect Celtic to give it the traps flying but I mean Hibs are also going to be looking at the fact that we've got no man, no one Yama as well for the final you know I mean? Kyle as well or Kyle so you mean like there, there's, there's two big players especially one Yama I mean he'd be first choice mm. in the middle of the park I mean, who do you put in there instead obviously Scott Brown oh. back I hope Bruni Bruni will, Bruni will plug that gap, eh? I mean, I uh, oh, just a quick one on Bruni. Three months out, look at the performance on Saturday. Uh, I mean, that's was incredible. It was wild. It was even that good, I turned around to Liam, I had a few pints and that, and I turned around to Liam and said, Dylan McGeoch's played well today, isn't he? <laughs> 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 the, the, the ball day, I'm like, he's like, that's Bruni. I says, all right. <laughs> see, 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 see the <laughs> idea he was playing. See if we can just touch on Scott Brown. How 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 good is he as Celtic captain? There, just everything he looks, he looks like he's enjoying himself so much on the park. Even when the, the cameras went to him and they dug it, when they when they announced his man in the match, and he's sitting laughing, him. he's sitting yeah. laughing now with his teammates. Now he 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 loves Celtic. I don't think he came. I mean, you hear a lot of time a lot of players don't come as Celtic fans. Gordon Strachan did become a Celtic fan, but he left as a Celtic fan. And I think Scott Brown. Has grown to love Celtic as much as any of these guys. I, I would agree, and I know, I know, a couple of my mates have been in nights out with him and stuff like that. And he is a Celtic captain on and off the park. Mm. See, like uh, Christmas nights out and the like, end of season dues and that. He organises everything. He organises everything for all the players, and he pays for a lot of his own pocket as well. And he is the captain on and off the park. Seemingly the way he conducts himself and ever, and he always makes sure all the younger guys are looked after and whatever. And seemingly he's, he, he's just, he's the man. You know, he's took the man alone and he's went with it and fair play to him. Yeah. Fantastic. It's also it's brilliant to have a guy like that at the club as well for like young, younger players coming in, new players coming in. I'd say he's, he's almost like a goodwill ambassador as soon as you walk through the door. You know? I, mean, I, think he, I think he's getting better with age. I mean, I know he's obviously we've got a bit worried about him with injuries and stuff like that. But I think he's he's a better player now than he was a few years ago. Yeah, uh, I think you're right. I think I think really? he's I think he's, he's he's wiser in his play. You know what I mean, remember remember like maybe five five years ago, maybe four, even four years ago, he was a bit of a bit of a wild man on the pitch. He'll be going like at some point this guy's going to guys going to set off, or he's going to spend most of the time just arguing with people. Now it's like, I mean there's a lot there's more of a smile on his face now when you see him play. Uh, you know? I think he's still maybe you'll know better than me Paul but I think he still takes today with a youth team in Edinburgh or whatever That's he goes yeah. to watch them and things like that aye. I mean, and he still goes to Hibs games doesn't he aye, I mean, a, he, he, he's done a lot of great things that he's known these guys shoot some balls with but one of the examples when he went to Celtic uh, he got a 250 grand sign in own fee and he, he gave it to Hibs Youth Academy because that's where he came to you know and it just you know, compare that with Kevin Thompson, who ran for the money and just basically told everybody he was a Rangers fan all his life, which was complete crap. Um, and, you know, he's done an absolutely phenomenal amount for um, skin cancer charities, obviously, in the death of system and stuff like yeah. that. But I think it is, he's kind of grown into the role. And you see some of this, I mean, everybody oh, he runs about like an English chicken. You see him now, he's timing his runs, his yep. skill, he's pulling the defenders out of position and that kind of thing. And as he said before, you know, he looks like he absolutely loves playing for Celtic. Right. You, you, you get the feeling of looking at him that maybe Celtic gave him something as well. I mean, Celtic gave him something extra in his career that that helped him sort of become the player that he's become. You know, and that's that's a good thing for us to see as well. I tell you, I tell you something. I got my daughter. Uh, I was in Tullacoutry, Joe, at the weekend. Uh, uh, 
you in the volley away? Well, well, no, I was just with my daughter and I went to visit my dad on the Monday and I went down to the Sterling Mills and they've got the big Nike store there and they sell, by the way, anybody who's close to Tillicourty, that area, go and visit Sterling Mills, there's loads of Celtic bargains to be had, nice training gear and all that, really like knock down prices for the Nike store. That, as a side, that's a side point. I got my daughter, I got the Celtic jersey, the, the hoops, and she was asking me who, who she get, she should get in the back, and I said, I, I, said, I said to her, get Brown number eight. So, so there you go. It was, it was the first person I thought of for her to. She says, who should I get in the back? And I says, get Brown number eight. One of the reasons, bro, well, he's still going to be there, I suppose. <laughs> and I guarantee that. Like, but, Sound investment. Yeah, but he's also, he's also, that's where I would put him in a, a pedestal at the minute. Like. Aye, it's great to see him back, i got to say. We're up to, uh, it's 25 to 10 now. Aye. 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 I have a, a couple of wee things, Joe, that I need to... Go ahead. I was I got an email from a, a good friend of mine, Kevin, um, who, who, who I worked with years ago. And they've got a... This is a, this is a charity thing, part of the, the 125 for 125. Uh-huh. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a project called the Celtic Anthology Project. Paul, this will probably quite interest you. Aye, uh, I know. I've, I've done stuff for it, actually. Aye, it's a great project. Well, well, Paul, do you, do you want to talk about it? Or? Well, basically, it's people like, you can follow these guys on Twitter, old, old pesky. Well, old pesky is Kevin, that's who I'm aye, talking about. Doing at, at, at L. Wordsmith, uh, Bogan Roman, to like that. They're putting together a series of stories and poems and things like that uh, to, to hopefully get out and publish it, and then all the money raised will go for the 125 for 125 charity for Celtic. And they're trying to get, you know, just some different stuff like poems and Stories that maybe were not out there and stuff, so it's, uh, it's definitely worthwhile. And if you get in touch with any of them, you can submit anything you like, and they're the guys that are putting it together. Right, and the, and, the, and you can look that up at Celtic Anthology uh, at CelticAnthology.wordpress.com online, and it's got the whole thing about what, what they're trying to do, the, the stuff they're looking for people to send. And as you say, it's just wee short stories, poems, anything, anything about your Celtic life things. For your past, your first game, your greatest Celtic moment, stuff like that, and they're going to put it on a book. And it's got all going to be fans' stories, and it's a really good idea. So, as I get, as I, again, Celtic Anthology dot WordPress dot com, and, and as Paul said, uh, out old best game on Twitter. I can't remember the, the Twitter guys, but uh, that, that's all I had. To be honest, Jason, I don't know if you want to touch. Uh, Aye, but, but, but the key. Key. I don't know if you, uh, if, you if you know. If, uh, what kind of response to that? So, I don't know. I'll speak to Tommy. Uh, but we we launched the thing last week. We've not the Kano guys haven't officially launched it, but uh, it's we're going to be putting it out there. We'll be doing a bucket collection at the start of the season, I think, and uh, stuff like that. But what the Kano we're, we're looking for is for it's a grand old team to see, and we're looking for a thousand Celtic supporters that can donate one pound a month for a year. And uh, that pays for that pays for the sixty season tickets for the kids, you know, fifty kids tickets and ten adults tickets. I got fifty two uh, and eight, but sorry, <laughs> sorry, fifty two and eight. Is it fifty two and eight? Sorry, I thought it was uh, fifty and ten. But uh, the sixty season tickets the guys pay for, and uh, if we get a thousand Celtic fans today, a pound a week, a pound a month, sorry. And Harper, you set up the PayPal details, and yeah. if we'll we'll tweet it for the homeboys Twitter. And uh, all you need to do is cl- click the link and then you can sign up for it through PayPal because Paul and Harper said this a couple of weeks ago. So we're, we're setting up by standing order. You can do it that way also, but it's just as easy to do if you've got a PayPal account, click in it and it does an auto uh, renewal every month and takes a pound. I think you've got month. a pound, 25 what? pence a week. Aye, one <laughs> I mean, pound. Uh, you, it's something you're not going to see. It's doing the back of the couch money. Yeah, and if we got a thousand Celtic fans to subscribe to that, that's basically the core money for the Kano, the Kano kids every year. That's that sorted, and then if if the guys have got that behind them, then we can push on and further fundraise. And I think the goal would be to maybe buy a bus or something like that, so they've got a legacy there, yeah. and then they can make money from that. But this is a thing. This is an ongoing project. The Kano guys, they're unique to any football club in the UK. That this is solely funded by the fans that help other fans get to watch Celtic, kids from maybe underprivileged backgrounds and things like that. And another thing, if anybody wants to apply, if you've got a group of kids or you're, you know, a youth club or whatever, for any background, and if they're from Scotland, Ireland, even I think if they're from England, they could apply for it as long as they get transport. But if they don't have transport, contact the Kano Foundation at the Kano page 
and uh, the guys will never get their best to try and get the folk a lift to Celtic Park. Like, for instance, if there's any Irish kids come across, we could have a word with the, the normal supporters buses and things like that that are heading across to see if any can bring some of the kids across. Mm -hmm. So, MD, get involved in it. And any, if you, you're a member of a kids' football team, youth clubs, anything at all, your school, stuff like that, if you want to get involved in this, uh, <clears throat> just put a request in and the Kano they'll have their calendar for the next season when the fixtures are out and then you can put a request in and request the, the tickets for these games and just uh, I should apologise when I, I said I done that blog with all the stuff and I said I would put it on a banner and I completely forgot about it um, mind me tomorrow just and tomorrow night I'll have it on the Hail Hail Media website we've got that big banner ad at the top that changes with those three different ads mm. we'll, put a, we'll make that Kano you just go to click on that banner and it'll take you into the, the blog with all the links that you can just click on to go straight into PayPal. So if you don't have time tonight, but if you remind me tomorrow, Jason, I'll do yep. that straight after my tomorrow and that'll be the easiest way for people. Go to hailermedia.com, click on that banner and it'll take you straight in. And what, what the op another option as well is if you want to sponsor a seat, if you want to buy the 50 quid season ticket, the option's there as well and I think there's the option to get your name on the seat. So, uh, you, get one of the you get one of the children to come and love with you. That's right. You get, to keep <laughs> one. You, get, you get to keep one of them at the end of the season. <laughs> uh, aye, so it's an amazing. When, when I, I went and had a meeting with the guys after the game and uh, Saturday, and the, the work they do is absolutely brilliant. You know, it's amazing. And uh, they're, all, they're all just doing it for the love of Celtic and the love of yeah. seeing kids uh, that wouldn't normally get the chance to come and see Celtic. It gives them that opportunity. And uh, ah, my heart's off to them, so they've, they've tugged at my heartstrings and I'm going to get involved and try to do a, a fair bit more of fundraising for them and stuff like that next year. And I'm Jason, when you, see, when you see some of the pictures that they have up on their website of the kids and all that, and you straight, away, you're, you're, straight away you're like, alright, I've got to get involved in this thing. It's amazing. And plus, when you're there, Joe, you can hear about the goal Joe scored at Selic Park when he played on the park. And it's, 60 it gets, yards? It's it? five, five yards out every time you speak to him. I think it's 55 yards it was he scored for now. But it's something you didn't even get a chance to do, Harper. So that's one Joe's got up you. I'll get it next year. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's done then, is it? Aye. That's All right, that's, that's the end of the homeboys. The homeboys revisited the, 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 the old brigade are back. Um... I get a wee cup final special, maybe. Absolutely, definitely. Um, we'll see, though, that there, but you use Irish Catholics are all you need to get the old brigade in there. Eh? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's good to just, just one thing, Joe, actually. There's two anniversaries today. The first one is 25 years to the day since Macca secured us the centenary double, and it's five years to the day since the telly didn't work with Manchester. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and of course, uh, Tommy uh, Burns' anniversary as well. Be, yeah. Uh, so, aye. Yep. He's so, always in our hearts. Absolutely. Yep. So that's us done again. Another homeboy's done for the week. Hopefully, we'll see you for a cup final special. We'll tweet when that is, because God knows when it could be at this stage. Um, so we'll just say goodbye to you. Say goodnight there. Uh, everyone say goodnight, Jason. Oh, good night, boys. Harper. Good night, man. Paul. Good night. And Terry O'Neill. Oh, good night, guys. It was good talk to you again. No problem, Terry. Thanks Perfect, for calling in. Listen, the best, mate. Thanks for listening, everybody. I totally, we appreciate it. As uh, you may not, maybe you don't know, but you do know. We, we appreciate it, and uh, we love doing this. And uh, we'll see you before the cup final. Thank you very much. Hail, hail. Cold grey morning on a Glasgow street, a young boy in torn clothing has a ball at his feet. He shouts, Daddy, I'll play for Celtic, I'm gonna be a superstar. He says, Go out there and get it, son, show the jungle who you are. Daddy, I'll be a striker, I'll be deadly round the box, I'll win the treble, conquer Europe. And score the winner at Iron Rocks He was a boy And he'd always wanted To be a boy He was a boy And he'd always wanted To 
be a boy He goes pushing through the turnstiles With the old man by his side He hears stories of Brother Walford And the day John Thompson died Of Tully and of Johnson And of Caesar and Jack Steen And being captain in the hut Would always be his childhood dream But time had moved so quickly And his dreams are way back when And the old man seats it's empty They say he died, stop in the tent He was a boy He'd always wanted to be a boy He was a boy He'd always wanted to be a boy Now his own son stands beside him And among the sea of green He shows promise with the football And he grows to live the dream Come his granddad's anniversary He's Captain Darby Day He issues orders to the huddle Wearing the number of McStay The crowd, they roar around him As the ball comes to his feet He drops a shoulder like McCourt Only the keeper now to be Runs to the old jungle, his finger pointing to the skies. Pumps his fist towards an old man, and there's tears in both their eyes. Now he's a boy, 'cause he'd always wanted to be a boy. He was a boy. He always wanted to be a boy, like Tommy Burns. Big roll. He only wants.